Good morning. I am Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today we are holding a hearing on oversight on the topic of resilience in the face of sea level rise. We will also hear my resolution, number 509, which calls on the United States Army Corps of Engineers to reconsider the proposals made in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study, pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act and to consider sea level rise in addition to storm surge. Climate change is occurring at an unprecedented rate, and the current trend of warming in the Earth's climate system over the past several decades is clear. The atmosphere and the ocean have warmed, sea level has risen, and snow and ice levels have decreased. In December 2015, world leaders came together and agreed on a landmark international accord, the Paris Climate Agreement, to combat climate change and to fast track and strengthen actions towards a lower greenhouse gas emissions future. Through the Cli Paris Climate Agreement, almost every country in the world committed to work to curb greenhouse gas emissions in order to increase, to limit the increase in the global average temperature to below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue the efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. President Trump has since pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement, and I commend all the states and municipalities, including our own, who continue to work towards the goal of the Paris Accord. Two weeks ago, we found the situation even more urgent than first thought when the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The report indicates that human activities have already caused an increase in global warming with a likely range of 0.8 degrees Celsius to 1.2 degrees Celsius. The report further finds that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052. If peak temperatures reach 2 degrees Celsius, some impacts, such as ecosystem loss, may be longstanding and irreversible. The report also finds that temperatures on land on extremely hot days with mid-latitudes are expected to warm by 3 degrees Celsius at a global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and by 4 degrees Celsius at a global warming of 2 degrees Celsius. Marine ice sheet instability could be triggered around 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Coral reefs are expected to decline by 70 to 90 percent with a warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and with larger losses at 2 degrees Celsius. Finally, Populations at disproportionate ri higher risks of adverse consequences include disadvantaged populations, indigenous people, and local communities dependent on agricultural and coastal livelihoods. This is the backdrop for today's hearings. New York City has 520 miles of coastline. This makes our city particularly vulnerable to flooding related to sea level rise, storm surge, high tide, and sunny day flooding. On October 29, 2012, nearly six years ago, Superstorm Sandy approached New York City from the southeast, causing high winds and a 14-foot storm surge. Sections of Lower Manhattan, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Queens were inundated with seawater. Superstorm Sandy flooded approximately 17% of New York City's total landmass, or 51 square miles. Leading city efforts to build a stronger, more resilient New York is the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. The office is guided with scientific data and analysis of the New York City Panel on Climate Change and works to ensure that New York City's communities, economy, and public services can withstand and combat the impacts of 21st century threats such as climate change. This work includes spearheading a resiliency program with a $20 billion budget. We look forward to hearing details about this work at today's hearing. In addition to city efforts, the, New York city, the, New York, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is investigating measures to address future flood risk in the New York, New Jersey Harbor region. This includes the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Focus Area Feasibility Study, which is a subject of Resolution 509 being heard today. Today, we will consider the efforts of the city and the Army Corps of Engineers to manage the threats from climate change, 
increased precipitation, sunny day flooding, and sea level rise in the era of significant challenges to our ability to adapt. I don't see any of my colleagues here yet, so I look forward to hearing testimony uh, from the administration on the urgency of the work that must be done. When we see uh, the emissions models and, and the precipitation models where large swaths of New York City uh, will be challenged by climate, by sea level rise and climate change, we must act. We must act quickly. And, and the time to, to walk down that path has long since passed. We have to start running in a much quicker way. So I look forward to hearing on the work that we're doing together. Commissioner, and you'll be sworn in by our, our attorney, Samara Swanson. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, the Mayor's Director of Resiliency. I want to thank Chairperson Constantinidis and the members of this committee for this opportunity to speak about the de Blasio administration's work to build a stronger, more resilient city in the face of sea level rise caused by climate change. Six years ago, Hurricane Sandy devastated New York City with unprecedented force, claiming 44 lives and causing over $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. It was the costliest natural disaster we have ever faced. As we took stock of the damage, it was clear that we could not just plan to simply recover from the storm. Instead, we needed to use the moment to address the risks of another Sandy, while broadening our approach to prepare for the chronic imp impacts of climate change, including sea level rise. The necessity of this work has never been clearer. Hurricanes Florence and Michael, which tragically devastated communities in the Southeast and the Panhandle of Florida, combined with the recent Intergovernmental Pl Panel on Climate Change's findings on limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, have reaffirmed the need for our climate resiliency work and highlighted its urgency. That's why we are making bold and innovative investments in resiliency. With 520 miles of coastline, sea level rise is among the most challenging climate risks facing the city. Since 1900, we have already witnessed one foot of sea level rise, a fact that made Hurricane Sandy so devastating for New Yorkers. The New York City Panel on Climate Change, or the NPCC, projects that sea levels will rise up to an additional 30 inches by the 2050s. Preparing our city for sea level rise is at the core of our multi-layered 1NYC resiliency plan, which has become a global model for other cities striving to build resilience in the face of climate change. To be clear, as we mark the sixth anniversary of Hurricane Sandy and take stock of our progress, our city is safer and more resilient than it was before Hurricane Sandy, and we have much more work to do before we'll be satisfied. I'd like to provide the highlights of the city's progress on addressing sea level rise through our one NYC resiliency plan, comprised of a multi-layered approach to coastal defenses, infrastructure, buildings and land use, and neighborhoods. Needless to say, our resiliency work to date is a product of a massive team effort led out of the mayor's office and implemented by nearly every city agency, and which includes state and federal agencies, as well as a myriad of community organizations and private philanthropic and academic partners. I also want to thank the city council for being a partner in our efforts. This high level of interagency, intergovernmental, and cross-sector engagement underscores the progress that's being made toward mainstreaming consideration of sea level rise into our actions and investments across various levels of government and in partnership with the private sector. Our coastal protection efforts protect against long-term sea level rise. Every major coastal protection project we undertake incorporates the latest sea level rise projections. For example, the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project is more than just a storm barrier. It is being intentionally designed to address long-term sea level rise. This is true of other projects citywide, including coastal barriers that are being implemented by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Staten Island and the Rockaways. Our Ray Shoreline Citywide Program is investing $125 million to reduce the impacts of tidal flooding and address sea level rise through strategic localized investments in vulnerable communities. An RFP has been issued for a $47 million project to raise the edge of Coney Island Creek, which proved to be the most vulnerable breach in the neighborhood during Hurricane Sandy. Our infrastructure investments account for sea level rise now and into the future. After Sandy, Con Edison agreed to use the NPCC's sea level rise projections to inform their storm hardening efforts, which included spending over $1 billion to harden, protect, and elevate key electric, gas, and steam assets. We are working with National Grid on a similar effort to protect customers and key assets from flooding impacts. Other infrastructure systems are being adapted as well. 
The Department of Environmental Protection undertook a comprehensive climate risk study of its 96 pumping stations and 14 wastewater treatment plants and has begun implementing cost-effective protective measures tailored to each facility to improve resiliency in the face of future flood events. Additionally, in April 2018, we released version 2.0 of our climate resiliency design guidelines to ensure that future capital investments, both new construction and significant rehabilitation, are designed to withstand the impacts of a changing climate. The guidelines provide designers and engineers with step-by-step -step instructions and tools to incorporate sea level rise and other climate projections into the design and construction of capital projects. Our building and zoning codes and standards are climate smart. Hurricane Sandy demonstrated that structures built to the latest codes perform well in storms and better protect their inhabitants. We have learned from this and have upgraded the city's building codes, including 16 new local laws, thanks in no small part to the council's leadership, to account for vulnerabilities related to extreme weather and climate change. Additionally, FEMA, in partnership with the city, is drafting new, more precise flood insurance rate maps that will more accurately communicate risks and keep premiums affordable. The city is working with FEMA to create a second, first of its kind flood risk product, reflecting future conditions that account for sea level rise. Finally, the City Planning Commission has created a new zoning designation, the Special Coastal Risk District, to limit exposure to damage and disruption in the most vulnerable communities by limiting future development, especially in areas where sea level rise is projected to lead, reg lead to regular tidal flooding. And the Department of City Planning is currently working with community members and property owners across the city's floodplain to update the flood resilience zoning rules through a future citywide zoning text amendment. Our communities are better prepared. We are working to strengthen social cohesion in our neighborhoods to ensure there is improved coordination between community-based health services and faith-based organizations and the government during an extreme weather event, which could be made worse by sea level rise. One example of these efforts is securing dedicated staff at New York City Emergency Management to conduct emergency preparedness trainings for community-based organizations. We're also working to strengthen social infrastructure, such as the small businesses that communities rely on during and after emergencies. Through the Business Prep Program, the Department of Small Business Services sends a team of emergency planning and insurance experts to small, to small businesses in flood-prone areas to review their physical space, operations, and insurance coverage, and provide assistance with preparedness planning. Businesses are then eligible to receive a small grant to implement measures like flood pumps and portable generators that can reduce their risk in the event of a disaster or disruption. Through RISE NYC, the Economic Development Corporation is providing innovative resiliency technologies to Sandy-impacted small businesses to help prepare for future storms and sea level rise. It is also crucial that New Yorkers remain aware of their current and future flood risk. To ensure residents keep their homes and finances safe, the city's consumer education campaign is directing residents to floodhelpny.org, a one-stop shop for flood risk information. And we know that this outreach is making a difference. Flood insurance enrollment in New York City doubled from 25,000 in 2012 to 55,000 in 2018. Our environment is cleaner. The city has achieved its one NYC goal of remediating, remediating 119 lots in the coastal floodplain, 19 more than proposed in 2015. These cleanups make the city more resilient to climate change and sea level rise by greatly reducing the risk these properties pose from erosion and pollutant release during future storms. Finally, the Department of Environmental Protection not only requires facilities that store hazardous chemicals to file a risk management plan, but it also now requires special protection for chemicals stored in the floodplain. In the event of a flood, these facilities will be better prepared to avoid environmental contamination that can lead to public health exposures in our coastal communities. We believe that there is no silver bullet solution and that a tailored and multi-layered approach is best. As we look to the future, we will also have to begin to consider where we may not be able to keep the water out and the strategies needed to allow people to safely live with water. Communities will play a vital role in grappling with these hard questions and the de Blasio administration is committed to working with communities across the city. It is also important to keep in mind that sea level, ride, sea level rise is not the only risk of climate change that New York City faces. We are simultaneously working to address the risks of storm surge, extreme precipitation, and extreme heat, all of which impact the city now and into the future. As I conclude my testimony, I would like, like to thank the committee for this opportunity. Building resilience in the face of climate change is a long-term and ongoing process. We will always need to innovate and adapt to account for rising sea levels and rising temperatures. I look forward to working with you to adapt our city to the risks of climate change. Your partnership is critical to build a stronger, more resilient New York. We'd be happy to take your questions.
Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, so I'm just going to ask a bunch of questions and, and uh, okay. look forward to hearing your answers. So in your opinion, how prepared are we for another Sandy or another Superstorm? The city is safer um, than it was during Hurricane Sandy, and we are better prepared than we were six years ago. Uh, we have improved our, our emergency preparedness measures, um, including our evacuation plans. Uh, we have hardened our infrastructure to minimize disruptions during and after an extreme event. Um, we have uh, improved social cohesion in our neighborhoods, um, which is a really important factor in uh, allowing neighborhoods to bounce back more quickly. Uh, we have updated our building codes and our zoning codes, and we have implemented coastal protection measures, and there's a lot more to come on that front. So talk to me a little bit about these uh, building measures, these, these, these uh, uh, looking at the DOB and, and talking through uh, some of those uh, changes in the building code that we have implemented. Uh, what happens to those buildings that were not, uh, that were in those regions but not affected by Sandy, that weren't raised? Or you know, how, do we, how are we helping those homeowners ha you know, take advantage of the opportunity to uh, change over their homes to be resilient, to be safe? Uh, what are we doing in those neighborhoods to work with them? So we have updated our building code. They account, the building code now accounts for the latest uh, floodplain maps that we have from FEMA, um, the 2013 preliminary flood insurance rate map. So this is the best indicator of flood risk we have. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, have passed 16 local laws to also update our building codes. Um, I could go into this in detail, but the highlights are uh, basically to make sure that we're maintaining uh, basic services of a building in the event of a flood event. Um, in the event of a, of, of a flood or a storm. Um, and uh, we are um, also, we have released these climate resilience design guidelines, which actually go beyond the code and take our projections for sea level rise, storm surge, extreme pre precipitation, and extreme heat, and provide guidance to designers and engineers on how to incorporate those um, projections into the design and construction of uh, buildings and infrastructure moving forward. Because one of the questions I have, I know in my own community, um, we were in, you know, there was a flooding on the Howitz Cove Peninsula. Eight buildings in the Astoria houses were impacted. The other buildings there were not. Uh, FEMA, and this is more of a FEMA question, right, which you're not qualified here to a answer. Um, but the only buildings now in that development that are getting their infrastructure moved to their roofs and getting the things done that need to happen for resiliency are the eight buildings that were impacted. If the, if the House Cove Peninsula would be able to be, were tragically hit again, um, the other buildings would not be as prepared. So how are we working with the federal government, who I know is not helpful uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, to make sure that we're getting actually all of our buildings on our coastal areas uh, in, into resiliency, especially public housing, who those residents uh, definitely uh, need our help. So we have been providing feedback to various um, of, you know, federal policy proposals about the need to ensure that we have proactive uh, funding streams to um, uh, address these inherently proactive measures that you're talking about. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the federal funding that comes um, to cities like ours to do this inherently proactive work is inherently reactive and flows after a disaster. Um, but with this in mind, we are trying to create a policy environment to ensure that building owners can proactively take these measures to protect their, their buildings and their inhabitants from future flood risk. So the federal government, as, as I could probably guess, is not being helpful at all to being proactive in looking at climate change and sea level rise and storm surge in these areas? Well, I wouldn't quite go that far. I think that the federal government is um, certainly taking sea level rise into account okay. in, um, in various projects and investments they're making. Um, you had asked me specifically about whether there are FEMA dollars flowing to uh, address, you know, raising uh, electricals and other utilities right. and mm -hmm. buildings that well, were not impacted by a previous storm. And um, that that has not been the case. With that said, um, you know, recently there was legislation passed um, in Congress that uh, created a new pool for pre-disaster mitigation dollars. I think we have yet to see exactly how those dollars will be allocated, um, but I think New York City is in a good position um, to capture some of those resources, and we should continue to uh, advocate for that kind of funding uh, going forward. 
So we will be looking when, when that when those dollars when it's sort of the criteria that's put out to apply for those dollars, New York City will be there ready to make our case to why we need those dollars. Certainly. All right. So moving forward, uh, what are the areas of the city you feel are most at risk to sea level rise or storm surge? Um, well, we have 520 miles of coastline, so our um, coasts are certainly at risk to sea level rise and storm surge. All right. Um, what is our planning around different areas of the city, uh, Brooklyn, in the Red Hook, Coney Island area, in southeast Queens, northeast Queens, areas such as those that have either been previously hit or, or have in a flood zone that they will, could potentially be hit by a major storm? So we are taking a phased approach in terms of um, protecting our communities against the risks of sea level rise and storm surge. Um, we're implementing short-term, medium-term, and long-term measures simultaneously to make sure that we're putting protection as, in place as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, in the short term, um, we're working with New York City Emergency Management to install interim flood protection measures, including in um, Astoria. Um, these are uh, temporary measures that protect against uh, five to 50 year level storms, including sea level rise, um, that uh, consist of um, HESCO bags and uh, deployable uh, tiger dams um, to ensure that we're keeping infrastructure safe now. These are things that we can do um, immediately. We're also investing in um, protections to protect communities against the, the risk of sea level rise and tidal flooding through a raised shorelines program. Um, so this is the $125 million investment that I mentioned in my testimony. Um, and we're and so the, the, those kinds of um, sea level rise protections, I would qualify as kind of medium term protections. There's another great example of this in the Rockaways, where the mayor announced last uh, year during the Sandy anniversary that we were keeping the um, uh, uh, money that was saved through the Rockaway boardwalk in the Rockaways um, and investing it in Bayside communities to protect those communities against the risks of sea level rise. Um, those projects are all in design and um, construction should begin as early <coughs> as next year. Um, we are also investing in major coastal protection projects that are um, much more complicated and take longer to implement. Um, examples of these projects are the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, um, the Two Bridges Project in Manhattan. Um, I, didn't leave to, I, didn't leave, leave to, I didn't mean to leave our friends from Manhattan out of my, when I asked about Brooklyn Only Queens. So. <laughs> no worries. Uh, no, they're right there. Uh, that's why I'm mentioning it now. Um, <laughs> and uh, and projects that we're implementing um, in part that the Army Corps of Engineers, I should say, is implementing in partnership with the city, um, which I'm sure you'll hear more about um, in the Rockaways and Staten Island and um, through the New York, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. So the, we're taking a multi-pronged approach. Um, I think it's also important to mention that coastal protection is not the only solution to protect communities against the risks of sea level rise and storm surge. We're also taking a policy focused approach. That's why we have updated our building codes. We have updated our zoning codes. We will continue to do that. We are working with FEMA on making sure we have more accurate, um, scientifically sound flood maps um, to uh, ensure that we're keeping flood insurance rates affordable. We're doing outreach to ensure that communities, our, our residents, um, are uh, aware of their flood risk and know how to buy flood insurance. Um, we are uh, working on incorporating future risk through our climate resiliency design guidelines um, into the construction of capital projects. So we are taking this multi-pronged approach to protect communities across the city um, from the risks of sea level rise and storm surge. So just a couple of questions on, on that answer yeah. uh, that, that you just gave. Um, number one, uh, so when Let's say I, I do a, a parks project, right? They give me a estimation of how much it would cost. Built into that cost is the resiliency measures, or is that something that the, the administration is putting in separately? How are we coordinating with city agencies uh, on the resiliency and sustainability piece uh, when it comes to renovations of you know, schools, parks, libraries, things of that nature? Um, so we are, uh, we've released version 2.0 of the Climate Resiliency Design Guidelines last April. Um, they uh, uh, provide tools to ensure that agencies are able to conduct their own um, uh, benefit of cost analysis um, for projects uh, moving forward. Um, we will have to continue to work with OMB on exactly how the budgeting for these projects work. This is a, a fairly new policy, mm -hmm. um, so we'll continue to do that. We're actually in the process of developing a risk assessment methodology to accompany the, the guidelines. So this is a, a work in progress for sure. We um, released a preliminary version of the guidelines in 2017. Um, 
um, test fitted those guidelines, learned about how they work um, on, on actual projects. Um, but while we're improving the guidelines to make sure they're as applicable and user friendly as possible, um, we are also uh, applying those guidelines. So DEP has already started applying those guidelines on several projects um, and, and will continue to do that. I mean, I've seen some great examples in my neighborhood when it comes to uh, partnering with DEP on, on making it more resilient on, on rain gardens and other opportunities for us to capture rainwater. Uh, I'm, but those money bills were uh, CPI parks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to make sure that you know, we're, we're doing that for every project. Because um, we've seen a lot of really great examples, but these were large amounts of money that were spent. And it was a partnership between the administration and our office and the borough president, which was great. But I just want to make sure for the smaller parks projects and, and for other projects as well as we renovate our libraries and kind of many of them are in our flood zones that we're doing the same thing. Uh, and we'd like to make sure of that as well. <laughs> and you talk about um, the outreach to communities that are, have a, uh, that are found to be within the flood map. What, is it, what does that outreach entail? How much are we spending on that outreach? Uh, talk to me a little bit about what, what that looks like. So we've partnered with the state and a nonprofit organization, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, on that outreach um, to uh, ensure that consumers are aware of their flood risk. Um, the city has invested about a million dollars into that into a consumer education campaign called FloodHelpNY.org, which directs consumers to um, a website where they can uh, understand uh, exactly what zone they're in and um, what steps they can take to ensure that they're protected. Um, the state has also invested uh, in in this program. Um, and we have flood insurance outreach events happening on a very regular basis. In fact, um, the Housing Recovery Office will be hosting two um, events this week um, during City Hall near Borough and Queens. Oh. W where are those going to be? I do not know off the top of my right. head. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. And we do a lot of sort of reaching, you know, trying to get people there, right? We're, we're doing a lot of outreach as well to make sure that people know this event's happening and so on. Definitely. I just want to acknowledge that we're joined by my colleague, uh, Carlos Menchaca from Brooklyn. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how are we addressing uh, groundwater, rise, groundwater table rise in areas like Southeast Queens that have traditionally had groundwater but now are exasperated by sea level rise. What are we doing in those communities to deal with both of those issues? Um, I'd like to actually defer to my colleague Tom from DEP uh, to speak to that. Yeah, Tom, Tom, come, come to the microphone. <laughs> we just gotta, we just gotta swear you in, Tom. And we can be happy to hear from you. Mike as well. Uh, too, yeah. All right, uh, more, more the merrier. Sounds good. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Can you re repeat the question, Councilman? <laughs> sure. Now you're making me think a little bit harder. Um, so I'd asked about you know, areas like in Southeast Queens that have uh, a groundwater table that is already pretty high. I know that we've invested close to $2 billion in sewer infrastructure there, but what are we doing as sea level rise exasperates that problem and is making ground rider rise? So I'll start and then I'll go to the end yep. mm -hmm. um, So, you know, in addition to the $2 billion of unprecedented funding that we've done in Southeast Queens, as you know, we did the uh, radial study, mm -hmm. uh, radial collection study this past year. And while it proved to be feasible, it showed that it was difficult to be able to find sort of a direct route that would reduce the table in terms of gaining access with property and also uh, the cost. Um, so we're disappointed sort of that that doesn't seem as feasible as we had hoped. But we also, um, as you know, passed, uh, your legislation passed to require us to do a study on the geothermal technique that we're going to look and see. Um, so we're going to continue to review. Very excited about that. Yeah. So we're going to continue to work on that pilot. We're going to, you know, continue to figure out what we can do to find a solution to this problem. I know, you know there's about a dozen or so organizations that seem to be most troubled by this issue. And so we continue to work, you know, with you to figure out the best uh, method possible to help alleviate some of that flooding. I don't know if you want to talk specifically about the... Well, just on the radio groundwater. So we, I mean, we haven't completely given up on the concept. Uh, it, it, 
it's mostly tied to being able to find a free discharge and uh, with the elevations in southeast Queens that can be real challenging to find a waterway we can make it to um, but we are furthering that study okay. and then what I know that the commissioner had talked a little bit about the wastewater treatment. So I've got you sitting here. I might as well ask those questions so you don't have to get up and get back. Um, but talk to me a little bit about the wastewater treatment plants. What, it, what is being done? Um, I know you talked about it. The commissioner talked about it generally. But talk to me, you know, drill down a little bit with me on how we're making those wastewater treatment plants uh, more resilient. At the same token, we know that there's going to be more rain. We know that precipitation is going to be uh, increasing. So what are we doing to make those wastewater treatment plants even more effective or to add new ones? What, what is our plan for this additional rainwater that's going to be hitting our sewers as well? Sure, so I'm gonna talk a little bit up front. Um, so the Bureau of Water Treatment, who's wastewater treatment, who's not here, has the plan, the resiliency plan on our 14 res, uh, wastewater treatment facilities. I don't have the individual details, but I know we have sort of a targeted approach uh, and you know new need list for each of the different um, types of resiliency efforts we need to do, which differ sort of across the board, depending on where in the city they are. So we'll get, we'll follow back up on the specific details. We have a, a publicly uh, accessible resiliency plan online, but um, in terms of the detailed uh, description of each, I don't have it yet. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with increased precipitation, uh, a lot of work at DEB has gone into that. I'm gonna let Tom talk a little bit more specifically about what that entails. So for the increased precipitation, uh, we are currently within our drainage plans looking at both um, the, the current climate and uh, 50 years from now and mm -hmm. what the impacts could be then, um, where, where, it can, uh, where it makes the most sense from cost-benefit analysis, especially along the coastal lines. Uh, we're, we're looking at whether or not we can increase sewers, raise elevations, um, and, and try to mitigate the sea level rise and, and make the sewers large enough to um, capture all the water. The, the challenges of obviously be um, having enough room in the streets to build these sewers and also some of your elevations are very fixed due to the low-lying areas. But we're actively seeking out solutions to these challenges you just raised, correct? Yes, we're, we're currently investigating all opportunities. Okay. And then I guess the, I, if, I know you have questions. Indulge me two more, and and I'll and I'll and I'll let you uh, do your thing. Absolutely, I don't want to take up the whole hearing. I know you want to hear from Carlos as well. Um, so, what are we doing on resiliency upgrades for our food distribution hubs, for areas such as Hunts Point, Terminal Market? How are we making sure that uh, in a large storm um, that these areas will be protected in the long term? Yeah, that's not us. So I'll do yep, that it goes back to the commission. <laughs> yeah. So we conducted a food resiliency study, um, and it turned out that one of um, one, one of the main findings was that our food uh, supply chain is actually more distributed than we thought it was, um, which is good news. Uh, that's what we like to see when we're thinking about resiliency um, to ensure that there's uh, th that we don't have fail points in, in um, certain areas. So um, we are uh, working with um, our Office of Food Policy and um, the Economic Development Corporation to um, implement some of these recommendations. Um, but in uh, in short, uh, there is good news on this front in that um, it is it's not the uh, it, we're not as vulnerable as we we once thought. That's an, that's good to hear. I guess the last question I'll ask before I uh, turn it over to my colleagues is talk to me about the uh, the Army Corps of Engineers plan. Um, do we think that any of the six resiliency alternatives uh, address sunny day flooding as well as sea level rise in in the plans that are currently out there? Um, well, I would say, yeah, and you're going to hear more from the Army Corps of Engineers directly on this, but um, I would say that we're very, very early in the process. So, um, you know, the uh, one thing I would say is that um, uh, the Army Corps is certainly taking sea level rise into account, um, even as they're proposing storm surge barriers. Um, you know, we, we have to account for future storm surge when we're um, uh, planning for storm surge across the city. Um, and uh, they're also um, considering some shoreline protection measures. Um, but these projects are, um, first of all, uh, a very long way off. Um, uh past the, the study, which you'll hear more about directly from them. Um, there's a congressional appropriations process that would have to happen in order for these projects to become realities. Um, and uh, there would be still a massive amount of public engagement um, so that the public can chime in and provide input into these, these options. Um, and uh, construction could take 
a very, very long time for some of the kinds of things that are being proposed um, in this study. And so, uh, you know, the city is not um, wasting any time. That This is why we are implementing, we're investing $20 billion across the city into resiliency now to implement um, coastal protection measures now so that we are not caught flat-footed um, and, uh, you know, we, we are not, we're not just depending on, on this one process. Um, we are fully at the table with the Army Corps of Engineers studying these options with the states of New York and New Jersey, however. Thank you, Commissioner. I look forward to hearing from them as well um, this morning. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over. I know that we we're joined by Councilmember uh, Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn. Thank you for being here. And I'll turn it over to questions to Councilmember Venchaka. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all for being here today. So I, uh, I, I think it was really great to hear about the, the food distribution and that, that you're feeling confident. Is there, is there a study that, that can be presented as far as the analysis on, on that that you can share with the committee on that? Um, I'd be on? happy to share the study with the committee. I'm not prepared to present the study right now. That's fine. If you can just share that and then we can, we can kind of move forward. Sure. That w and I think we're all thinking about that and how to, how to bring it back to the community with, with some analysis. The second thing is, is really more of a kind of multi-agency conversation that I'm hoping is happening, and if you can kind of talk to me a little bit about how it works around, and I'll give you an example, how it works when, when the, the kind of resiliency investments are coming into our communities and a new park is birthed, and uh, questions around on-site storm water management, uh, surge, storm management, uh, water surge, and and where what's your role in that in that conversation within say the parks department? Uh, there's a question here about the building codes, and so what what role do you play? And then I have a more specific question, but just give me a sense about what what's happening right now with the admin. Sure. So um, you know, it's it's extremely important that resiliency um, and the the mission of implementing resilience measures across the city doesn't just sit with the mayor's office, but rather is owned by every city agency um, across the administration. Um, and so we uh, to that. Um, to that end, we have updated our building codes, we've update our, uh, updated our zoning codes, we've developed climate resiliency design guidelines that provide uh, guidance to every capital agency on how to incorporate uh, sea level rise, storm surge, heat, and, and precipitation projections into the design and construction of capital projects. Um, and we're very happy to provide technical assistance to agencies as new projects come online in order to ensure that we are um, uh, taking resilience into account. Um, the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, um, first and foremost, is a policy leadership shop um, across the, the city um, to provide this kind of guidance to create the policy tools and levers that are needed to make sure that we're taking resilience into account. Um, and I think we've made some good progress on this front, and there's a lot more work to do. And, and you have. And, and I've, I've, seen, I've seen documents where uh, agencies show that vision. It's in the implementation that I think we're, we're still struggling with some of it. Um, and you offered to connect to projects and be a thought leader and join them in that, that kind of design. Uh, what, is your, what has been your role in, in parks projects, say, across the, the city as a whole? Um, well, there are uh, many parks projects that um, have taken resilience into account. Coastal parks projects, a, a great example, is the um, are the projects that uh, were announced in uh, Councilmember Richards' district last Sandy anniversary um, that uh, are, is using the the savings that we um, were able to capture from the Rockaway Boardwalk project to invest in parks improvements and resiliency improvements on the uh, the bay side of the Rockaways. Um, so we have been um, working with the parks department. To identify some of these opportunities and uh, bake resilience measures into the projects, um, even if uh, at, at times some of the, uh, the, the, at times the projects weren't originally conceived as resilience projects, but I think the Parks Department has been, has been a great partner in um, uh, working to uh, make sure that we capture those opportunities where possible. Great. This is this is exciting. I think that's where the the synergy can really help move things forward, especially when when there's a lot of momentum with agencies that want to construct a certain way and and really helping them think differently. Uh, I'll follow up with you in your office about Hal Ikes uh, and the skate park. It's a three million dollar project in Red Hook. Okay. Uh, we're not really happy with 
with the Parks Department's response to uh, stormwater management on site. And I think everything that you just presented today, everything we're talking about today, every every inch of work that happens from here on out must be met with the fiercest commitment to resiliency as we think about stormwater management, uh, resiliency, sea level sea level rise, and and I hope that you can join us in that advocacy as we. Um, as we build multi-million dollar projects in our, in our neighborhoods, especially a place like Red Hook. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing with us. The analysis would be great to get for the food yep. uh, and then also the food distribution, yep. but also um, I'll follow up specifically on the Red Hook project Sounds good. for your, 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 your um, advocacy. Great, we look forward to working thank with you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchak. I guess I'll take the liberty of asking a few questions. Um, so you spoke of the different coastal projects that uh, obviously we work with parks on. We're working with parks on. Can you give me a, a status report on where we're at uh, with those projects? So all seven projects are currently in design, yep. and um, we expect construction on all seven to begin by 2020. So by 2020, all seven. And then can you just speak a little bit um, more to your coordination with the Army Corps. What does that look like? How often is City Hall communicating with the Army Corps? So I know some of those projects along the Bay, um, you know, conflict possibly with some of the work that Army Corps would 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 be doing. I guess in 2022. Um, so can you speak to a little bit uh, about the coordination between your agent, your department, and, and Army Corps? Sure. Um, we. Uh, speak to the Army Corps on a regular basis. Um, and the the projects that are proposed on the bay side um, of the Rockways do not conflict with the, um, okay, so with the Army Corps plan. Okay. We're making sure that all of that's well coordinated. We don't want to um, uh, spend dollars duplicatively in any way. So all of that should be coordinated and synergistic. And uh, can you speak to uh, re any of the resiliency projects going on in Staten Island? I know my district, we're aware of some of those projects, but Staten Island, Manhattan, I know Carlos covered Brooklyn. Can you just speak a little bit more of what your strategy is uh, in Manhattan and Staten Island? Um, sure. So we're um, moving forward uh, uh, with uh, great urgency on um, projects uh, in, in both boroughs. Um, in Staten Island, we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers on a um, armored levee on the east shore of Staten mm -hmm. Island. Um, I think geotech surveys have begun, um, and uh, there's, there's much more to come very soon. Um, in Manhattan, we are um, working, uh, by the way, on the Staten Island levy, um, construction is expected to start in late 2019. Um, in uh, Manhattan, um, many of you may have heard that uh, we're, we've, we've just announced a, um, a, a development with the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project um, that uh, will um, uh, allow us to deliver the flood protection an entire year sooner than we originally expected. Um, so we're um, excited to be moving forward with that and be able to deliver flood protection to this vulnerable community um, as, as quickly as possible. Eastside Coastal Resiliency will protect 110,000 residents, including several important NYCHA developments. Um, we have, uh, we're in schematic design on um, uh, the Two Bridges Project, which, mm -hmm. which is just south of the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, and we're also working on a long-term study um, for the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency uh, Project, which is south of Two Bridges and sort of around the tip of Lower Manhattan, um, and uh, look forward to be able to, able to share results from that study very soon as well. Now, these things are all going to cost money, and um, so I'm interested in knowing. So is there any concern on the city's part on these projects being fully funded from the Army Corps? Is the city willing to fill some of these gaps? So can you speak a little bit to your understanding on funding? And is this funding secured? Are we ready to really move in 2020? Um, so can you speak to that? So I may have misunderstood the original question. Not all of these projects are funded by the Army Corps of Engineers, right. and I should be very right. clear about but that. The, but the portions that are funded by Army Corps. <laughs> okay, so um, we have several federal partners that um, provide funding uh, to these coastal protection projects. The Army Corps of Engineers is one of them. There is also um, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, is another important partner, and FEMA is also another important partner. So I just want to make that clear. Um, no, the administration, for all the projects that we have, uh, that I just went over, the administration is absolutely fully committed to making sure that they become a reality and so um, they are uh, th there's no concern about funding we will make we will um, 
uh, move forward with them with great urgency and um, and especially with uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, um, we uh, where we have uh, recently announced that there is a, a new need, um, the city has said that it will fill those gaps. And can you speak to groundwater issues in Southeast Queens? So how are you working? I know DEP is in the room. Yes. Uh, how are we looking at that? And DEP Hi, Mike will Deloach. Hi. to address Remember. that question. So we actually, um, the chair had asked that. I Wait, think uh, here, but, uh, actually, what's um, your name for the record? And Michael Deloach, I did. I was sworn in. <laughs> okay. Oh, you did. Okay. Um, so. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we did the radio collection study, which didn't prove to be as successful as we had hoped. Um, but you know, with the council passing the the bill to um, mandate us to do the geothermal okay. uh, pilot, we're going to shift gears and see if that direction works. But uh, we are definitely uh, heavily focused on finding out a solution, you know, to help eliminate the need for pumping in the basements of some of these institutions. Okay. I, I and how soon will the pilot start? I think we have a year to do it, but I'll get you the specific timing. Uh, we won't wait a year. Um, and then uh, my last question is on wastewater treatment plants. So I'm not sure if that was brought That one was done. It was, it was yeah. as well. Okay. Sorry, I had to vote across the street. That's okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, if you can just touch a little bit on um, uh, so what are you doing in the event of major storms when the gate uh, when it comes to the gates if gates would be closed would that impair um, or hamper uh, uh, water treatment the title yeah the title gates I'm gonna have um, Tom come back because that's a little bit more technical than I'm yeah. able to do what I want to could you do that for certain projects And if you could touch on long term, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Well. So, uh, start with um, so obviously, we have the combined sewer overflow issue, uh, especially in parts of Queens. You know, uh, how are you, what is your strategy to deal uh, with this, and how are you coordinating with uh, NY New Jersey HAT study? I'm not familiar with the study. Yeah, I think so we're the, these are a couple of things bleeding together. So I think okay, got it. it. All right, let's start with the overflow plan. So what are we doing? So as as part of our overall drainage plan, we're looking at the um, impacts of both sea level rise as well as increased precipitation, mm -hmm. and where feasible, we're looking at sizing the sewers in order to try to attempt to manage that. There there are limitations to that, and it'll all be driven by. Um, the location of the sewers and, and how much real estate is available, as well as the elevations. And, you know, obviously precipitation is picking up more um, and is exacerbating the issue a little bit more around wastewater. So what is your strategy around dealing with this issue? With regards to the wastewater treatment plants? Yes. So flooding wastewater entering the system, and how are you looking to deal with that? as we know storms become more intense so um we we do have a, ma a wastewater management plan i'm not actually with the wastewater group so it's okay. not my strength um as far as you know the surface flows we are also looking at um locations where we'll be installing storm sewers such as southeast queens where there is very little infrastructure and that should significantly help the um managing the flows that are on the streets and i do want to commend dep for the work that they've been doing uh, in Southeast Queens, but just making sure, as we know, more precipitation. I know Howard Beach had some issues, I think maybe a year ago, where are we at with that? Did we put an infrastructure up there? In Howard Beach? Yeah, I remember they had a bad flood up yeah, there. Yeah, I don't know of any actual capital projects that we've done recently, but I'm happy to look. I mean, you know, we do, our sewers, you know, can only handle what they can handle, so sometimes with heavy rains, we do see isolated flooding instances. We're continuing to you know, invest in our infrastructure to where possible ensure that we can, you know, deal with the additional precip precipitation water. Last question uh, before I, I guess we go to the next panel. So one NYC plan, where are we at with implementation? Um, that's you, right? So uh, where are we at? I remember uh, being a part of that very early on a few years ago. Uh, where are we at with implementation around a lot of the recommendations that were made in that plan or any updates? on that particular plan that would address 
so many of the issues we're speaking uh, about long term. And there are certainly um, initiatives in in the one NYC uh, plan and and specifically in uh, the resiliency vision of the plan that address the issues that we're talking about here today. There are hundreds of initiatives um, yep. uh, in the one NYC plan. We release a progress report every year. The last one was released on Earth Day of uh, this year um, that uh, provided the latest progress on those initiatives. And there's a, there's a very detailed report. Um, I would also say that um, we're in the process of updating uh, the one NYC plan, the last whole, it came out in 2015, so yep. there hasn't been a wholesale update um, in almost four years. So uh, that update will, will be released in April of next year. So April of next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure the chair will hold a hearing on that. So, okay. all righty. Well, I thank you all for coming out. If there are no other questions, that's been all. Jaeger. All right. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, Danielle Marley, New York City Panel on Climate Change. Jessica Roth, Riverkeeper. Joseph Seabold, U.S. Army Corps Engineers, my favorite. Paul Galley, Riverkeeper. Well, I think I'm reading this right, Paul Galley. Riverkeeper Joseph Seabold, U.S. Army Corps, Jessica Roth, Riverkeeper Daniel Marley, NYC Panel on Climate Change. Army Corps? Army Corps here. All right. Sit on the hot seat. I'm playing. It was a joke. <laughs> hey, Bryce, why don't you sit here? We're going to ask the Army Corps to go first. Can you see if you can get this work this works. <laughs> make all these things work. We have slides that they loaded up here. Slides up here? Yes. No problem. I think they're working on it. <coughs> Just waiting for IT to come down. My hero. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, which oh, one? Oh, the other one, right? As my two year old would say, ta da. Give me a minute quickly. 
we'll just ask you to state your name uh, and title for the record and organization, and then you may begin. Good morning, members of the New York City Council, and good morning to everyone here today who is participating to learn more about this important topic. My name is Joseph Seabode, and I am the Deputy District Engineer and Chief of Programs for the New York District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. With me today on my immediate left is Mr. Bryce Weismiller, who is a Senior Project Manager with the New York District. I want to begin today by thanking the Council for the opportunity to present information on the important topic of sea level rise and efforts underway by the Corps of Engineers to identify comprehensive options to reduce risk to lives and property from coastal storm impacts in the future. I have a few slides that I will use to illustrate the path forward on that study. Slide two. When Hurricane Sandy hit the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area in late October 2012, it caused major damages from storm surge and wave action, which was exacerbated by sea level rise. This slide depicts the coastal storm flooding probability from intense storms such as Hurricane Sandy. Unfortunately, 43 individuals lost their lives from the storm impacts in, from Sandy in New York State, including 24 on Staten Island. And there was tens of billions of dollars of economic damage to the region. Three months after Hurricane Sandy, Public Law 113-2 was signed into law. That emergency supplemental bill made available federal appropriations to improve and streamline disaster assistance after Hurricane Sandy. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers received approximately $5 billion to repair and restore damaged coastal storm risk and navigation infrastructure in the region and build new projects to provide resiliency and risk reduction. Repairs to over 30 projects within the New York District's region have been completed and we are actively working on the remaining portfolio of authorized projects which will include, among others, major projects in Staten Island, Jamaica Bay, and the Rockaways. A unique feature of Public Law 113-2 was language that provided $20 million to perform a study to establish vulnerabilities and resiliency options for the North Atlantic coast from Maine to Virginia. Completed in January of 2015, the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study concluded with a finding that there exist nine vulnerable locations, known as focus areas, along the coast that warrant greater study and evaluation to look at resiliency options for the future. One of the nine focus areas identified is the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. A feasibility study has been initiated. The states of New York and New Jersey have signed on to be the cost share partners for the study, and New York City is a full partner in the steering group for the study. The study will look at a series of comprehensive options to reduce the long-term risks to the coastal system from storms, including the effects of sea level rise. While early in the study process, the study will be done using the latest sound science and with multiple levels of review, not only within the Corps, but with other involved federal, state, and local agencies to include an independent peer review and review by interested stakeholders and the public. Slide four is a graphic which depicts the Corps' projections for relative sea level change at the Battery in Lower Manhattan with the yearly averaged actual measured levels for the past 25 years. It shows a trend data line that is being used in developing alternatives for comprehensive resiliency. These projections are comparable to those developed by the two states as well as New York City. 
As so much uncertainty is associated with sea level rise, we will be performing sensitivity tests in the study to ensure that resiliency plans being considered are adaptable should sea level trends change. We are currently in the scoping phase for the study with an expectation to identify a tentatively selected plan in early 2020. Slide 5 shows the current timeline for the study. Please note particularly the yellow dots at the bottom of this graphic, which depicts the numerous time where agencies, stakeholders, and the public will have opportunities to review information and attend public meetings on the study. I would like to emphasize that we are early in the study, which we expect to take several years to perform. We are evaluating a wide array of significant sized and significant costed measures, all of which have been successfully implemented in other areas of the country or the world. Our initial array of alternatives, which are various, various combinations of measures, span the spectrum of conceptualized solutions for this unique geographic area. There is no decision pending today or in the near term to recommend, much less implement, any alternative as we continue to collect and synthesize information received from contractors, partners, and the public. Slide 6 provides links to information and points of contact for anyone interested in the study or wishing to provide comment during or after the current scoping period, which closes on November the 5th of this year. Finally, slide 7 summarizes the key factors related to this study we would encourage the Council to consider as you discuss the serious risk that New York City faces from coastal storms now and into the future. That completes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So I, I want to start off with an apology. Uh, I apologize for having to run across the street. They were voting on a land use uh, item in my district that I had to be present for. Um, so I apologize for having to miss the beginning of your testimony and having to step out during this hearing. But I, uh, I'm a council member. I got to juggle, as you guys do, several things at once. Um, so I guess the first question that I have is, uh, uh, how does the Army Corps engineers engaged? Oh, wait, here we are. Uh, Talk about the storm surge barrier. How does, it, how does it positively or negatively affect dissolved oxygen in our harbors? If I might, Councilman, um, storm surge gates, barriers as they're commonly referred, are one measure that is common within a number of the alternatives in a number of locations throughout the estuary. We are just now initially evaluating them using existing modeling tools that we have, which mm -hmm. are primarily based on physical factors, flow, uh, looking at conditions during ambient conditions as well as during storm conditions. Should any of those surge gates in those various locations make it past this first initial screening, the subsequent stages of the study would evaluate the more complicated factors such as water quality and those type of effects. We're very early in the study and there's a number of different locations. The vast uh, spread or spectrum of these alternatives that we have are so broad that we needed to do an initial screening to try to hone in on which ones might show promise, if any. At this point in time, we don't know that any of the alternatives that we've identified are economically justified or environmentally acceptable. They're just conceptual approaches that looking at what's been done elsewhere and looking at this region might be workable here. So, I mean, I, I have other questions about how it would affect uh, CSO discharge, but I'm guessing the same uh, answer would be we would, that would, if those alt, uh, measures and those various alternatives are carried forward, we would have to evaluate that in far more greater rigor. All right. Um, what about for those areas not uh, within the barriers? What would the what would some of these plans mean for those areas just just outside the storm barriers? Well, your question of induced flooding, which I believe is what you're talking about, that mm. the barriers are closed, the water goes somewhere else. Right. It has to go right? somewhere. <laughs> that that's a common. Um, that doesn't always apply to coastal storm surge systems. Fluvial systems, river systems, that's a more common feature. 
That being said, that is a good question. It's something that we are looking at using the existing tools that we have now related to some of the storm surge barriers. I should point out, though, that that question that you raise is not specific to just surge gates. Um, east side resiliency project, those type of issues have been raised with that type of where you have shoreline-based measures. So induced flooding is a common con uh, consideration to any coastal storm management alternative. So and I should point out that if there is induced flooding, that that would have to be mitigated as part of that alternative. And that's true if it's a surge gate or a shoreline-based measure. That would have to deal with those induced flooding as part of that measure, and the cost for dealing with, with it would be factored into it. So this is not a net win scenario. No one gets to benefit at the cost of others. Uh, that's important. And I guess the, the next question I have, and I think I'll let our friends from Riverkeeper uh, testify, and then we can kind of have a more uh, sort of a, a deeper discussion. Are you know it's what does it mean when you had said that you were taking sea level rise into account into into these plans? I know they're very early. I know if this was a baseball analogy, uh, we wouldn't be in warm ups yet. We'd still be back in the dugout, like getting ready. Um, so, but still, how do, what does this uh, do to take sea level rise into account? Um, oh, absolutely. Our initial screening is focused on the severe coastal storm systems, um, and that is primarily because um, a lot of the measures that are involved with these alternatives are very high-cost alternatives. Uh, surge gates are, uh, if anything, expensive. Um, so we are trying to use this initial economic screening to try to hone in on those, if any, that might show promise for further evaluation. That being said, um, we would um, – oh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I, I got lost in my thought there. <laughs> no worries. It's early in the morning, and, and, and um, the question I had was that, you know, when you talk about, and I know we're very early in our thought process, Very, you've made that very clear that this is very early in our processes, um, but that being, leaving the baseball analogy aside, uh, the uh, what does it mean that you're taking sea level into account oh. as part of these early plans? Yes. So the design on these um, this initial array of alternatives that we have. There are five with project and then the no action or future without project condition is the sixth alternative that we use as a baseline for comparison. So for initial screening, we're designing them all to the same standard, which is the 100-year storm event with the intermediate sea level rise. So um, with shoreline-based measures, those deal with both the high-frequency and low-frequency flood events. So sea level rise is embedded within them. But with the surge barriers, they deal with the surge and sea level rise during storm events and dealing with sea level rise as part of its um, ambient risk, if you will. That is to say, sea level rise is a very slow moving millimeters per year type of activity, mm -hmm. right? So the communities that are affected by it will change as time goes on. And so dealing with those localized uh, floods, like what you see at Broad Channel or what uh, Coney Island Creek and then other neighborhoods in the future. If barriers are done, dealing with sea level rise in those other locations over that time span can be done, but it doesn't have to be the 15-foot flood wall that holds back both storm surge and sea level rise. <coughs> it just needs to be the three-foot or five-foot or whatever it is to deal with just the sea level rise because the barriers hold back the catastrophic storms that cause death and, and s severe damages throughout the study area. There's a little dichotomy in how the surge barriers work. They're not meant to work um, as the magic bullet. They have to be done in tandem and in combination with other measures. It's a systems approach. Okay. I, I'm actually going to, at this point, uh, turn it over to my colleague, Donovan Richards, who has a few questions before he has to go to a meeting, and then we'll have Riverkeeper go. Unless anyone has any Thank questions you. for the Army Corps prior to Riverkeeper's testimony. Oh. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've heard the study of the study of the study for many years um, happening. Um, so my question is on implementation. Do, are you fully funded, and is there enough funding in the budget right now? And if you can give me the total cost of, for instance, the Rockaway Reformulation Plan, how much will that, that cost to, to build these barriers? And is, that, is the funding fully in place as we speak right now? For the large scale, large scale. Mm -hmm. comprehensive study, mm -hmm. we have money available 
and our sponsors, the states of New York and the states of New Jersey, have committed their share to bring the study all the way to an, an the identification of an alternative. Okay, so that's I, going to be mm -hmm. about fifteen million dollars. Fifteen million to 15 carry million out the for the study. Okay. Now I, a, I mentioned a pricey I mentioned, study. It is. I mentioned in in my remarks that. Public Law 113-2 provided $5 billion to the Corps mm -hmm. to execute a whole series of different types of projects mm -hmm. after Hurricane Sandy. We have expended all of the money successfully to repair and restore all of the projects that were damaged after Sandy. So we put sand at, at Rockaway and Coney Island and a number of other locations in the region. We are currently now working through the remainder of our portfolio to execute projects that were previously authorized by Congress but had not received an appropriation. So we are, we are going to begin by the end of next year, as you heard earlier, the $650 million South Shore of Staten Island project. Uh, we are going to proceed with the approximately $450 million Rockaway and Jamaica Bay project next year. Now, that, that funding is in place. That funding is available. It's and available. It will be locked in okay. upon signatures by the state and the city and the Corps on documents that we call a project partnership agreement. And when do we anticipate that? We are actively processing those documents, and uh, I'm hopeful we are going to sign them very, very shortly. And that will lock Shortly, in a them. month, a two, a three. I and I, and I just, I'm just year. speaking. Okay, this, this year. year. Okay. So we got them on the record this year. This All right. year for the PPA okay. on Staten Island. Okay. For, for Staten Island, yes. but not the Rockaways. Rockaway early next year. Early next year. Summer, spring, fall? Our goal is the spring. Okay, the spring. Um, so you spoke of coastal erosion a little bit, and I'm sure you've been hearing about some of the issues we've been having in the Rockaways. How are you working with NYC Parks? Uh, do we anticipate uh, Army Corps coming back out to deal with? We have a great relationship with the city, and particularly with the Parks Department at Rockaway, where we have done projects in the past very successfully, where we have integrated into our navigation projects where we're dredging in places like East Rockaway Inlet and Rockaway Inlet opportunities to use that sand beneficially in highly erosional areas on the ocean front of Rockaway. And we are looking currently at projects that we will be funded for in 19, hoping that Rockaway or East Rockaway Inlet are, is in there, and if so, we'll work with the city to try to uh, use that sand beneficially. And I want to commend you for the work that you've done, but there's still some gaps, and so you're saying FY19, we could possibly see some progress there, or? We're, we ha we're, we're waiting okay. to see which projects are funded in, in FY19 by the by the administration and by and NYC so, Parks or by the no, federal by administration. the federal administration. Federal administration. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, there's an urgency with that. Um, you did some great work out there, but there's we're actively engaged with this. And you're aware of the beach having to close a section of it. We're, we're actively engaged with the city and the state and others to seek opportunities to uh, improve that situation. Um, and let's just speak of: Are you looking at so when these projects are implemented? Are you looking at them from standpoint of an, with an EJ lens and I'll, I'll say this because a lot of times projects start and for instance for the you know, I want the whole entire peninsula to reap benefits uh, because we all no matter what our socioeconomic status was or religion or color we all were hit by Sandy she didn't discriminate um, but one of the things we've always run up against is projects not being equitably started or so so from my point of view uh, in the community that I represent, which is about 70 percent of the population who are uh, largely comprised of public housing residents and, and low-income residents, um, what is your strategy to ensure that we are protecting the most vulnerable amongst us who may not have the resources to get our homes rebuilt? Uh, so it is, it, is a, it is a topic that okay. uh, can be difficult 
uh, given the way the federal system is set up to determine whether projects are able to proceed. We call it the benefit-cost ratio. Mm -hmm. Your tax dollar and mine, when, when being considered for a project, have to, we have to be able to demonstrate that there is a one-to-one -one benefit for the cost of the taxpayer dollar. And sometimes when you're trying to build smaller projects, the benefits are not able to be accrued to get you there. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we're doing the comprehensive study, and we're looking at comprehensive solutions for the larger New York, New Jersey Harbor area. It's clear that when we combine all of the potential benefits for the region, that we have a lot of opportunity to use federal tax dollars because we can, we can get to that benefit one-to-one -one benefit cost ratio. That notwithstanding, we have been successful in most of the locations we have worked in around New York City to be able to justify federal expenditures under the Sandy Bill for projects. There are a few areas where it's a pretty significant stretch and we're working through looking at opportunities to have betterments paid for by the city and the state to support our efforts. And I think we've done a lot of good, but the, the, as we proceed, we will have to discuss this as as an issue, particularly in the context of the harbor and trip study. Right. I'm going to wrap up. I think we could walk and chew gum at the same time. So I'm hoping that you know, as plans uh, shape up and, and implementation begins, that you know we're looking at perhaps starting simultaneously these projects, so that once again there's a benefit to. Uh, the diversity of the Rockaways uh, economically and socially. I, I will only conclude with, I showed mm -hmm. the slide with the points of contact and mm -hmm. the places folks can get information on the comprehensive study and we, I want to encourage everyone to participate. This is, the, this is a federal study in partnership with the two states and the city and we want public engagement, we want the public to help us develop the alternative that this region ultimately will go forward and seek federal appropriation for. Thank you. Look forward to uh, continuing to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richards. Councilman Menchaca. Uh, thank you for coming and testifying today. Uh, 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 Councilmember Richards, I'll give you a quiz really quick, or I, for the whole committee. Uh, there's something else that costs around 10 to $15 million in study that the mayor wants to use money for, and that's the BQX. It's a lot of money. You're absolutely right. Uh, and I think we, this is why we need to really think about how and we move forward uh, for something so so big. And so my question to you all is, and, and I hope that I didn't miss it in your testimony, but uh, whether or not you're studying any other alternatives that don't have a gate component. I would say absolutely. Uh, you are. You are. Can you tell us a little bit about what, sure. what that looks like? Um, so I mentioned earlier we have this initial array of alternatives, five of them, that span a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum there is a large barrier system. It's been proposed actually for decades. that goes from Rockway Sandy Hook with land tie-ins to high ground along Rockway Peninsula as well as Sandy Hook. And then at the Throg's Neck. And there's also outside of that a uh, gate system proposed in the Pelham Bay area in the Bronx. At the other end of the spectrum, there are nothing but land-based measures. So in between that, the three that we have are basically hybrids that involve either surge gates at different locations further into the harbor area combined with shoreline-based measures. For example, in alternative, I, I don't expect you to know these, they're on our website if anybody wants to look them up, uh, alternative 3B. Uh, it involves a, a surge gate on the Arthur Kill Channel, it's actually a tidal street, uh, and the Kill Van Coal Channel. So a lot of the harbor area is still left open to coastal storm risks. So for that measure, there are shoreline-based measures in Jersey City that tie into what New Jersey is planning in Hoboken, a rebuild by design project, similar to what the city has on the east side resiliency. On lower Manhattan, we tie, have a shoreline-based measures that tie off where the two bridges ends goes around the battery and of course we're going to be looking to build off what the city is advancing for that 
planning effort that they have going from the two bridges down to the battery, but that basically completes the big U. It also has shoreline-based measures in East Harlem. It has a um, shoreline-based measure in tandem with surge gates that has been developed separately under the Rockway Jamaica Bay reformulation, which covers the Rockway and Jamaica Bay area. Uh, then it also has a um, uh, surge gate structure that the city had studied in Gowanus Creek and Newtown Creek. It has shoreline-based measures in Long Island City, Astoria, um, Flushing Bay and Creek, the Bronx, East Harlem. So there's a whole number of shoreline-based measures that are in a lot of these alternatives. The idea is to identify all of the areas that have high risk that do not have existing plants in place or uh, to deal with coastal storm risk and to try to build off of that to make sure that we have as much comprehensive protection throughout the estuary. The idea is to try to identify which of these alternatives shows the biggest promise and then uh, one or two and then to focus in on those. They are been, uh, right now they're very uh, much focused on this 100 year storm event, but we need to also look at the natural, uh, non-structural measures that might also be complementary to these alternatives, as well as natural and nature based features that would be folded into these alternatives as we flush them out further as the study proceeds. So just so I could understand, and I want to go back and look at some of this myself, but uh, so I represent Red Hook and Sunset sure. Park, big coastal community. And what you're saying is, uh, separate and apart from these larger gates, sea gates, that you're looking at shoreline options that, that, that kind of speak to a kind of uh, a shoreline gate style, but on the shore, not on uh, or in the ocean for, uh, for mitigation. Is that right? That's, that's generally correct. But what I think what you're asking is, you know, notwithstanding this larger study for a comprehensive long-term solution that would likely cost billions and currently does not have money appropriated for it, has a many years of study left to proceed before we're ready to make a recommendation and a conclusion in concert with the region and the states and the city, what are we doing now? And, and you know, I, I mentioned in, in my testimony, we've completed over 30 projects, the core, but there is a whole host of agencies that are spending money at all levels of government to improve resiliency. And, and Ms. Bavishi did a great job identifying some of the things the city's doing with their $20 billion, FEMA, HUD, EPA, New York City Parks, New York City DEP, New York State. There are many, many agencies. And as this resiliency continues to be brought into the city and the region, we're getting, we're getting more robust in our resiliency. Our big issue, though, will be, will we have enough to stop a storm of the magnitude of Sandy, even with all of these resiliency measures in place? And some of the things we're proposing like the buried seawall at Staten Island, we believe would have completely changed the outcome there if it was in place before Sandy had hit. In Coney Island, in, in, we've, we've modified the, some of the groins there. We've built tea groins. We've placed sand on the beach. We're, we've put a lot of sand in Rockaway. We're doing a lot of projects on the New Jersey Bay Shore. There is a lot of additional resiliency that has been put in place. But we need to finish this study Knowing that sea level rise is going to continue, knowing that storms may intensify in, in the future, and see if we come up with a project that ultimately is, I won't say palatable, but a necessity for us to, to be able to maintain the economic engine of New York City and not put us in a place where the fragility or the vulnerability exists to a point where it, it affects our, our quality of life. And thank you for kind of re retooling the question and really kind of posing an answer that there are there there are measures being taken for immediate uh, responses to resiliency as we take care of this larger question of comprehensive and and really I don't know if you were here earlier when I spoke to a just a park getting reconstructed in in Red Hook of 
a incredibly vulnerable floodplain, uh, not just for a possible future surge, but a kind of daily occurrence during rainstorms and flooding, um, and possible storm surge. And and I I think that that the parks department is is failing us there and really kind of. Uh, meeting us at that juncture of collaborative effort. And so I hope that you can maybe join us in that, in that review of the new skate park that's fully funded by the city, uh, three point some million dollars, and has an opportunity to be a game changer and add to the multiple pieces that any one neighborhood would need. So I, I will you can can you join us in that in that conversation with the parks department and your your relationship with them? Not familiar with that particular project, but if uh, I don't know whether it would require some kind of a permit from us, but uh, I'm happy to talk with you more about Good. it. Good, and you'll get an invitation from me, okay. uh, uh, for sure. Okay. And that might be enough. That'll be your permit, <laughs> deputizing you to be part of part of the solution here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca. Uh, at this time, I'll let the other members of the panel, which I apologize, I, I walked in halfway through, uh, so I just assumed everyone was together, but then I realized afterwards, it took me a minute, I, no coffee today. <laughs> so I'll let our river keeper testify, and then we can ask any other questions of the whole panel, if that's, if that's all right with the Army Corps. Also, Danielle Manning. Oh, Danielle as well. All right, so Danielle. That's Jessica. Jessica, no, Danielle. Jessica. Danielle. Do you want her first? <laughs> uh, you guys are there, so we'll just go in that direction. There we go. Okay. You guys are, but you're a part of the panel as well, right? Yes. Have we called you yet? Yes. Okay, great. All right, I'm catching up. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. Jessica, thank you. Yep. That's what I thought. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Constantinides and Council members. We thank you for holding this hearing on the Army Corps of Engineers New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study and all the alternatives that are outlined within it. And thank you especially to Samara Swanston, Legislative Council, for all the work that you put into making sure this hearing had a wide range of voices to be heard. Uh, my name is Jessica Roth. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement at Riverkeeper, and I'm here today with Paul Gallet, the President and Hudson Riverkeeper. Riverkeeper is a membership organization with nearly 55,000 members and constituents, which protects the environmental, recreational, and commercial, commercial integrity of the Hudson River, its watershed and tributaries, working with and advocating for communities throughout the region, and safeguards the drinking water of millions of New Yorkers. We're here today, and we've been active every day since we learned about this process, um, because we have major concerns about the process and about the substance involved with this uh, New York, New Jersey hat study. To begin with, um, we are in, we are encaptured in this process that the Army Corps has is using called the three by three by three rule, which requires them to do this first first initial study within three years, for under three million dollars and engaging three levels of the Army Corps. As you've heard, there is an extensive amount of information. There's a massive impact zone of this project, and there's no way to viably do this initial study within the confines of this rule, which is actually a policy. So there needs to be a waiver, and the Army Corps has the authority internally to waive it themselves, but that has not yet happened. And so as a result, this entire process is being framed in a way that is making it destined for failure because there's no way to get all of what we need within that um, within the context. So that's the first step. Um, and that that we, that three by three by three rule is also therefore affecting all these other pieces of the puzzle. The timeline is untenable. Um, we've had a number of dates that have shifted in the course of the last six or seven months. There's now, um, as as was presented in the by the Army Corps, they have moved back a decision point of winnowing down these six alternatives to one or two of them until 2020. But the the stop, the end, you know, the end goal, the end timeline hasn't shifted. So now what they're doing is they're moving internally and we're just going to compress time in other places. Um, and as we can see, there's six massive proposals that are still incredibly new and still need a lot more information to be put into them. And without that, uh, we're really in trouble if we don't have the time and the place and the resources to get that into it. Um, obviously, $3 million in that context also feels very small, given the other numbers that are being floated um, in the context of the study. It also leaves out um, major pieces that will need to be studied and inherently disadvantages 
the environment because as we keep hearing about, all we're dealing with is a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and there's no financial value being placed on ecosystems. There's nothing, there's no monetary value, according to the Army Corps, of you know a flowing waterway or of the marine species that live in the water. So when we're only looking at a cost-benefit analysis, we're inherently looking at the wrong things and we're not going to have a full picture. And that's the only studies that are being done before the process gets winnowed down. So we're literally just looking at an environmental, um, we're not looking at any of the environmental issues. Um, and as Councilmember Richards pointed out, if you're looking also at cost-benefit analyses, you're disadvantaging environmental justice communities and other disadvantaged communities throughout the area because of where the dollar values get invested in the city and where they don't. So that's another really big concern of ours. Um, and then there's a number of issues, and those are the procedural concerns in particular, but there's a number of issues that fit into both procedural and substantive, and we have problems, obviously, with the substance as well. Um, we keep hearing this reference to the fact that these processes are going to address sea level rise, uh, and 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 I, I was very encouraged to hear the question from, uh, from you, Chairperson, to uh, ask about how this was actually being incorporated, but the answer doesn't actually assuage any of our concerns because, in fact, the big, especially the big barriers, will not deal with sea level rise. None of the things in the water are going to do that because as sea level continues to rise, they're, they remain open, right? This is one of the biggest shipping channels in the world in New York. So the, the barriers are supposed to be open most of the time. In that event, there's equal levels of water on both sides of the barrier. So clearly, as sea level is rising, there is no actual addressing of that issue in any of the waterbound barriers. Um, and as we've all seen from the IPCC most recent report, the numbers we've been looking at are just, we need to accelerate, you know, how we're, how we're setting out our timelines for everything and how we address everything and that sea level rise is going to continue to exponentially get worse. Um, and in addition to that, you know, the, the issues that um, were raised earlier about how that's going to affect, you know, um, combined sewage overflow and stormwater overflow, like none of those things are being incorporated um, clearly yet because everything is clearly still just getting figured out, as we see. Um, so the problem is that in addition to um, this promise of these being infrequent closures, the, the, we're building a system that's going to require the barriers to actually be closed more and more to deal with sea level rise, which also means that we're not addressing the full scope of what it means to implement them. So the Army Corps has really been tasked with the wrong question to begin with by not being asked to look directly at sea level rise and to be looking at storm surge and coastal flooding. It needs to shift the entire way that the study is being framed. Um, and in order to get a good understanding of what the full impacts are, it's critical that there is deep engagement in communities and in community groups throughout the impact region. That is a really important piece of this puzzle that has been, uh, quite frankly, very poorly implemented. Um, we were told at the very first meeting that an email went out to 714 people to inform them of the meeting. This impact zone is more than 2,100 square miles, involves three states, and multiple dozens of millions of people. To feel like 700 emails is anything close to an appropriate beginning of outreach is really problematic. Um, to make a point, I've been now at five meetings and have sat across the table from direct meetings with the Army Corps. I have yet to receive a single email from the Army Corps about any of their meetings or anything they are doing. I have also offered to help with outreach and engagement and haven't heard about that. Um, it's really important that we have, that people's voices are heard in this process. Um, as as it was pointed out by all of you, representing all of your different communities, you all have specific interests and specific issues that happen where you live. And if that is not being directly integrated into this process, then this process isn't going to deal with our problems properly. And it's clearly not going to do that if the outreach and engagement isn't inherently part of the process um, and also part of the record. We keep being told that there are places, that, the, that there will be more places for engagement further down the line, but they're after certain comment periods close or they're when records are closed. And so if it's not on the record, that's also a really big piece of the problem. Um, we have specific recommendations which are in our um, testimony that I've put, um, given to copies of, uh, copies to for all of you, and I'm going to read those in particular. Um, the Corps needs to develop a comprehensive plan to inform the public and to engage communities 
communities around their process. Here are just a few ways that they can make some of those changes. They must share which studies they are planning to evaluate and which they will undertake and when. They need to have and communicate with a comprehensive mailing list of everyone who has attended a meeting, commented, or communicated with the core in the area of potential impact. Because I know for a fact there are other community groups and environmental groups that re meet regularly with the core on other issues, none of whom were informed of this when it came down the pike either. Um, the core must undertake outreach to community groups, local elected officials, and environmental groups. They especially need to do authentic outreach and engagement with environmental justice communities and groups who as the most impacted by storm surge and sea level rise often have many solutions but may not have the resources to implement them. The core and New York State must also consult with federal and state recognized tribes who will be affected by the study. To date, there has been no mention of tribal nations. These must be real conversations with intentional information exchange. Um, and so just to say also that we, um, we have submitted um, edits to the proposal for the um, resolution as well with our testimony um, and to encourage that it, it's really important that this, that this study involves as many voices as possible. And I know that that means it has to slow down, but if we're going to do it correctly, um, I think it's clear from the IPCC that while time is shorter than what we thought we had, it is also critical that it is thoughtful, intentional, engaged, and really uh, responsive to the needs that we have. Otherwise, if we don't have solutions that meet all of those, we're just going to be bu building ourselves into, into a corner again, and we're going to have to fix all of these things down the line, and that's going to be billions and billions of more dollars to make things that are actually going to respond to the situations we'll find ourselves in very shortly. Thank you. May I add a couple of specific points in addition to my colleague Ms. Roth's points? But first, may I thank the Council, thank the Army Corps, the City Administration, New York State DEC, and the other partners in this process. My name is Paul Gallet, as Ms. Roth said. I'm the uh, president of Riverkeeper. Uh, I'm a former member of the uh, New York City Regional Office of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. So I'm no stranger to government process. I uh, was involved in the closure of Fresh Kills Landfill, the permitting of the Visi paper um, recycling plant on uh, Staten Island, and any number of other processes involving city wastewater treatment plants and the like. So I offer these comments with, with that perspective in mind. And I want to say first that if there is anyone in this room or watching this testimony who doubts the seriousness of this issue, this issue could not be more serious and could not be more real. When you have the administration of President Donald Trump saying, as they did in July of 2018, through the National Transportation Safety Administration, that it is expected by them that there will be seven degrees Fahrenheit warming by 2100. Seven degrees Fahrenheit warming by 2100. The laws of thermodynamics suggest that this issue of sea level rise and storm surge could not be more real or more serious. It's coming soon. It has been, with regard to Sandy and any number of other storms, already here. I know that when Sandy hit in 2012 at the end of October, I was bailing steps in my office, our pump having failed and it became a very physical, tangible thing, which is nothing compared to what others experienced. According to city data issued this April, there will be a minimum of 11 inches and as much as 24 inches of sea level rise just by 2050. Again, I'm going to repeat that just because it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. That can't be true, can it? Well, the city has good data that suggests that it will be between 11 and 24 inches of sea level rise in addition to what we've already experienced by 2050, which is just over 20 years from now. Riverkeeper is all in on this. We have been very critical of the process to date, but behind the scenes we have been actively engaging everyone in every manner we possibly can, including the Army Corps. And we are very grateful for an invitation from the Army Corps received just in the last two weeks to come in and begin a dialogue with them. And I believe that dialogue can be extremely productive. I do want to echo what my colleague Ms. Roff has said. Barriers are not an answer for sea level rise. Sure, they'll be built to take into account sea level rise, but they'll only 
deal with storm surge. We cannot parcel out solutions in a systems approach, as Mr. Weissmuller properly suggested that we take up here. A systems approach will not only deal with sea level rise and storm surge, it will also be community-based, as my colleague Ms. Ross, my, Ms. Roth has said. If we are going to get where we need to go on this critical issue, we are going to need f to follow principles of equity. We're going to need to be creative. We're going to need courage. And we're going to need luck. But most importantly, we're going to need to be community-based. And I want to remind the Council of their excellent work in 2012 when they created uh, Local Law 42. And Local Law 42 of 2012, which Riverkeeper worked with and which was passed unanimously and signed by former Mayor Bloomberg, requires the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability for the city to develop a community or borough-level communication strategy intended to ensure that the public is informed about the findings of the New York City Climate Change Adaptation Task Force, including the creation of a summary of the report for dissemination to city residents. And in developing such communication strategy, the director shall con consult with non-governmental and community-based organizations. If we are not community-based with these solutions, we are not going to come close to success on this issue. If you look at the best learning on solving problems of this magnitude, you'll see that so many of them are non-structural. So many of them are socially based. So many of them are based on strong community resilience at the neighborhood level, at the organizational level. So many of them are based on more creative approaches to land use. We have to re-envision how we are handling our land use. Rotterdam is specializing in issues which are generally referred to as the architecture of accommodation. That sounds very jargony, but at the very granular level, they are working so that the storm surge and sea level rise that they cannot barrier off or wish out of existence is managed constructively and thoughtfully and intentionally. So in summary, please implement Local Law 42. I call on the Army Corps to complete the waiver process. They're going to need not only more time, but more funding. It is essential. We cannot just say we don't know how it will affect dissolved oxygen if we build these barriers and then decide whether or not to make the barriers one of the solutions. That's flying blind. And this is not a time to be flying blind. You need the money to do these studies right before you select projects. And you need to consider sea level rise at the deepest and most fundamental level. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to testify. And I'm going to relinquish my chair so you'll have the opportunity yeah. to do so. If I can get you the computer, actually, I have a PowerPoint. Yep. Slide mm -hmm. yours. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Sure. We have that loaded up. And it's actually on my flash drive. Oh, okay. All right. I didn't do Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Danielle Manley. I work at the Center for Climate Systems Research at Columbia University's Earth Institute as a climate change researcher. I serve as program manager for the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and I want to thank you for having me here today. 
Uh, in 2010, the New York City Panel on Climate Change released its first report detailing, oops, sorry, the New York City Panel on Climate Change, or NPCC for short, is a panel of scientific experts from around the New York metropolitan region who advise the mayor's office on the latest climate science that's relevant here for New York City. It was formed in 2008 under then Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who saw climate change as a critical issue that needed to be addressed and managed by New York City, and that science-based decision making was key to this response. Since 2008, the panel has provided regular climate science updates to the city of New York. Uh, in 2010, the panel released its first report detailing risks to the region. The report was called Climate Change Adaptation in New York City, Building a Risk Management Response. In 2012, under Local Law 42, the New York City Panel on Climate Change was established as an ongoing body that is mandated to provide regular climate science updates to the city of New York. After Hurricane Sandy, the NPCC provided an update to its findings in climate risk information 2013, and the most recent full report of the panel was released in 2015, titled Building the Knowledge Base for Climate Resiliency, which provided the most up-to-date analysis on climate trends, future projections, and future coastal flood risk maps for New York City. The next report is due to come out in March of 2019. The panel takes a metropolitan region approach to its analysis because changes in climate don't stop at the municipal boundaries of the city, and much of the city's infrastructure and community network extends across the region. By looking at historical trends, we see that sea levels are already rising across the globe. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, globally, sea level rise has trended about 1.7 millimeters per year, or about 7.8 inches, since the year 1900. Across the New York metropolitan region, we have observed sea levels of over one foot since the year 1900, at a rate of about 2.8 millimeters per year in Bridgeport and in Lower Manhattan, and about four millimeters per year in Sandy Hook, New Jersey. This means that the New York City region is experiencing sea level rise at nearly double the rate as the rest of the globe. Many groups around the region understand and are working towards improving resilience to the risks that sea level rise is already imposing to our coasts. Nearly six years ago, on October 29th, 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City, bringing unprecedented seawater into lower Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and across the New Jersey coastline. The floodwaters reached a height of 14.1 feet in Manhattan, setting the record at the battery tide gauge. The storm left the region 11 days without telecommunications ability at critical facilities, two million people losing power, all of New York City's tunnels into and out of Manhattan shut down, displacing nearly five and a half million weekday riders, closing six hospitals, evacuating 2,000 patients, and at least 60 fatalities across New York and New Jersey. The events of Sandy were a renewed strengthening of action on climate change in this city, which was already looking to understand the risks. The storm was evidence that sit the city is already vulnerable today to sea level rise and coastal storm surge. Um, here are just some of the photographs of the floodwaters that came into the region during Hurricane Sandy. The top left shows waves crashing up against uh, and over top of a seawall adjacent to a park in Brooklyn. Um, you can see the Verrazano Bridge there in the background. Um, the park itself is a buffer zone that absorbs floodwater, which protects um, some homes that are just beyond it. The top right shows coastal flooding in Seaside Heights, New Jersey, during Sandy, um, which is a small community town on a narrow barrier island. Um, roughly midway between Atlantic City and Sandy Hook. In, in general, the barrier islands of New Jersey are eroding in part due to historic sea level rise and in part due to the presence of hard structures. Storms like Sandy continue to produce extensive beach erosion. The bottom left shows water moving into the former World Trade Center site when it was still being built in lower Manhattan. And finally, the bottom is a right, the bottom right is an image of flood water moving into the entrance of the past station in Hoboken, New Jersey. These images show the impacts that coastal storm surge flooding can have on our region. Severe storms also generate high waves and water levels that will lead to beach erosion and shoreline retreat. Sea level rise will generally increase these erosion rates. As sea levels continue to rise across the globe and in our region, st st storm surges from storms of similar magnitude to Hurricane Sandy will be able to reach further inland due to a higher baseline sea level. 
Coastal flood risks will be higher in the New York metropolitan region and all regions around the globe because of sea level rise, regardless of how the intensity of storms is affected by climate change. The magnifying effects that sea level rise are having and will continue to have on coastal flooding cannot and should not be ignored. Here are some of the latest projections that uh, the New York City Panel on Climate Change provided in our 2015 report. These projections are based upon the same global climate models that are used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The NPCC provides a range of future projections for sea levels here in New York City, resulting from the analysis of 24 global climate models across two greenhouse gas emission scenarios. A medium emission scenario, RCP 4.5, and a high emission scenario, RCP 8.5, as well as based on literature reviews and expert analysis. All projections shown here are in reference to sea levels in the baseline years, spanning the years 2000 to 2004, and are shown as a low, middle range, and high estimate for future sea levels across the 21st century. All of these possible future scenarios demonstrate that sea levels will continue to rise. Middle range projections estimate that the New York metropolitan region could experience 11 to 21 inches of sea level rise by the middle of the century and 18 to 39 inches by the 2080s. The high end of projections estimate that sea level rise could be as high as six feet here in New York City by the year 2100. These rising seas will exacerbate the effects of future coastal flooding, enabling storms of similar frequency and magnitude today to produce higher floodwaters in the future. Historically, the 100-year flood, or a flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year, is 11.3 feet in New York City. The data shows us that this level of flooding will likely become more frequent in the coming decades because of sea level rise. Today's 100-year flood could become a 50-year flood by mid-century, and by the 2080s could become a 20-year flood or even an 8-year flood. The future 1% flood heights are likely to increase as well, where today's 100-year flood of 11.3 feet could become 12 to 13 feet by mid-century and up to 16 feet in the 2080s. The key message here in all of this analysis is that coastal flooding is very likely to increase in frequency, extent, and height due to increasing sea level rise. This flood map developed by the NPCC in our 2015 report illustrates the changing extent of the 100-year flood zone in New York City as a result of heightened sea level rise. The purple areas indicate coastal flood risk today based upon the 2013 preliminary flood insurance rate maps. The light and dark green areas show how far those storm surge waters could reach in the next few decades in the 2020s and 2050s. And the yellow to red areas shows how those flood waters move even further inland by the 2080s and 2100. By the end of this century, we see that the 100-year flood zone nearly doubles in its extent compared to today's levels, and coastal flooding and coastal neighborhoods and infrastructure across the city will be at increasing risks. Some of the neighborhoods in New York City that are at, high, at the highest risk due to the effects of sea level rise will have on coastal flooding include southern and western Queens, parts of Brooklyn, Staten Island, lower Manhattan, and parts of the Bronx. Policies and responses to coastal flooding cannot ignore the exacerbating effects that sea level rise will impose on our region's coasts. New York City is already taking into account future sea level rise in planning for the future, like with the climate resiliency design guidelines that have been mentioned earlier today. These guidelines are a science-based policy that incorporate forward-looking climate data into the design of New York City's capital projects, including sea level rise. Tools like New York City's Flood Hazard Mapper help to illustrate to planners where facilities will be at heightened risk over time. While nations around the world are reaching agreements about how we can limit our greenhouse gas emissions, governments and their actions need to be responsive to the realities that we are facing. Given that we know that sea levels have been rising and that they will continue to rise, this type of practice in preparing for current and future sea levels should be the norm. The coast of New York and New Jersey will continue to be at heightened flood risk as a result of sea level rise for decades to come. Uh, here's the bottom line. Based on our research using the best available science, we know that sea levels have already been rising across the New York metropolitan region and that these rates have been nearly twice the global average. We are confident that sea level will enable storm surge waters to reach further inland across the New York metropolitan region today and into the future. We understand that coastal neighborhoods and infrastructure will continue to be at increasing risk 
from coastal flooding and storm surge as a result of this continued sea level rise over the 21st century. And we believe that the United States Army Corps of Engineers should consider sea level rise in addition to storm surge in the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act. And finally, we believe that in order for adequate preparation for the effects of storm surge and sea level rise throughout our region, that cross-jurisdiction coordination across the city, state, and federal, sp federal responses will be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Did I get everybody on the panel this time? Yes. All right, I got everybody now. All right, so um, asking a few questions, uh, back to the Army Corps. The, this issue of, I wanted to wait until the testimony of uh, the Riverkeeper um, to talk about this issue of three by three by three. Um, he discussed how you view this, this limitation on the work that you're doing and how can we how do we move forward from that in a way that it, it seems that it's absolutely limiting your work both in time and dollars? I do not disagree for the most part with the, uh, the comments made by, by Paul and Jessica. The three okay. by three by three is a federal law. Mm -hmm. It was put in place to push the Corps and, and to push the Corps of Engineers to complete studies faster and for less cost so that we could get to a decision as quickly as possible on whether a project should go forward or not. It was set up in the law by Congress as a one-size-fits-all. It obviously is not a one-size-fits-all. Right. We have requested a waiver, and we are looking for additional time and many additional millions of dollars to enable us to do a deeper dive into this overall issue so that we can come up with a good, technically sufficient evaluation so that a recommendation with our partners at the state and the city and, and everyone involved is is ultimately determined to be justified. So you're unable to waive it yourself? You need Congress to waive it for you? Or? It needs to go up to the, uh, the, the Assistant Secretary of the Army. Okay. So, so we've within, requested the waiver. You've requested the waiver. And, and, okay. And frankly, I mean, the waiver has not been granted, but I will. I expect the waiver will be granted, knowing that uh, we've we've asked for a very significant sum of money. You heard the multi-million dollar figure I right. mm -hmm. discussed earlier. Um, I I'm expecting we will get most or all of that initially to continue to proceed through the study. So with that. And what sort of timeline do we expect uh, for your request? When will that be answered? The request was advanced this fiscal year because okay. the appropriation bill that the federal government has for our agency was passed uh, last month. Okay. So the work plan that the Corps is developing now mm -hmm. for how to use the funds that Congress identified for us in that appropriation bill is expected to be released on November 21st or before. So the exemption process was accelerated for that reason, and right. so I would expect that we should know within the month. Within a month, okay. And, and at that time, yeah. uh, then we'll have an opportunity to have a wider conversation. There'll be a additional dollars that are being put into this, additional time to look at it, and are we, are we still gonna limit ourselves to these six current options, or are we going to be a little bit more expansive? Right now, the scoping period remains open until November the 5th. We're accepting public comment, and there are members of the public and, and agencies and others who are suggesting other alternatives that we should potentially look at. Once we have synthesized all those comments, we will, we will put together our, essentially our work plan on how to proceed. One of the things you heard today is very significantly is the, the desire to see a greater integration of sea level rise. That is absolutely being considered by us, mm -hmm. but our authority under law is coastal storm risk reduction. That's the authority. We're not in this to, this is, we do not have the authority to go forward with measures to essentially stop sea level rise, but we do have the authority in the context of our project mm -hmm. to identify ways to essentially mitigate or potentially ameliorate 
sea level rise through some of the actions we're going to take. And so that's to be looked at and developed over time. Every one of these projects alternatives that we're looking at, there are three key things we will do. Mm -hmm. We will have to determine that they are engineeringly feasible, environmentally acceptable, and economically justified. That's the benefit cost ratio on the economic side. And those are three hurdles that every alternative will have to go through. And Bryce talked earlier about the study effort to, to, to look at environmental factors like fisheries and, and dissolved oxygen and water circulation and, and, and engineering issues like backwater flooding or, or the actual ability to build some of these multi-billion dollar projects with the current technology that we have before us. Some of these have been built large surge barriers, large walls, pump stations, dunes, reinforced dunes, berms, you name it. A lot of these things have been built around the world, but when you start to think about how much it's going to cost to potentially armor or protect 520 miles of coastline, you're talking a very significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. Does the country have the appetite for that? Does the region have the appetite for that? That will all play during the course of the process as we work together to focus in on and winnow down the alternatives to those that we deem are reasonable. I think the challenge that I have is that I look at a November 5th date for the end of the comment period, and then I have a the 3 by 3 by 3 rule that may sort of help us expand the scope of your, your, your opportunity to look at these things, the opportunities to to engage, but the comment period will be closed. So I'm hoping I'm in the bucket of maybe we should take the time to, because you know, the issues of, I asked earlier about dissolved oxygen, the earlier issues around environmental ecosystems, the issues around CSOs, the issues about communities outside those barriers. Under right now, we're so early in the process that those things are not being taken into account. I'd like for us to, before we whittle down have that be part of the discussion prior to that. And Mr. Chairman, we are closing on November the 5th the scoping period. Okay. So we are accepting comment on what should be the overall scope. We did present the five or six preliminarily identified alternatives. Once we have all the scoping comments synthesized, synthesized we're going to develop a report and collect the information that I think you're hoping we will collect to be able More than to, hoping. Further, <laughs> that, to further develop which of these alternatives, what are the potential impacts pro and con associated with each of them. That will ultimately be a draft report that will go out to the public again for a for comment and review, public meetings and, and the like, so that we continue to have public engagement. All right, so that, that leads me right into my next set of questions with public engagement. So how do we get past, uh, how do we expand our, our scope of folks that we're speaking to in, in relation to this public engagement? How do we engage the communities of 520 miles of coastline to make sure that they're part of this process? And those that may not live on the coastline but are very interested in what happens in the city of New York. I'm going to let Bryce uh, address this in, in a second. I'll, I'll start by saying that we are New York City and, and, and you know, I went to school in the city. I, I, I've been here a long time. This is probably going to be the largest Corps of Engineers civil work study ever done in the history of our country. So we go into it. We're New York. We're big. We're going in big. Awesome. Okay. And Glad it's going to gonna be a very expensive study <laughs> and it's going to have very expensive alternatives. We have reached out. At the, at the initiation of the study to everybody that we could that we believed would be interested in this. And I know it's a, only a very small percentage of the folks that there are more people on the end train this morning. Involved. <laughs> so so we, are, we are continuing to expand our mailing list. Mm -hmm. um, again, I showed the slide that had the contact information. I encourage folks to contact us through those 
through those links, through those email addresses, and to get on our mailing list. And I, it's building, and Bryce, I'll let you make it any. I think you, I think you laid it out very well, Joe. Um, it's a daunting challenge trying to reach out to everybody, and, and Councilman, I would just say that, you know, within, it's not just 520 miles. The study area actually has over 900 miles of shoreline when you count the Hudson River and mm -hmm. all the New Jersey shoreline areas as well. So it's a daunting challenge, and, and we are looking to partner with the other groups as possible and try to build the outreach effort. The goal is to try to advance the sound science solutions that this region can support to address coastal storm risk, including sea level rise as we go into the future, because it's only going to get worse. I, um, I guess the next question that I have is, is really more of a statement. I'll say that we're happy to participate in those outreach efforts and engage the millions of New Yorkers that want to have the opportunity to comment on what's going to happen in the future of their city. Uh, you know, we most certainly want to make sure that everyone and everyone have an opportunity to be part of it, especially in those communities that will be most impacted. And as Donovan Richards talked about earlier, have the uh, are going to be the most impacted and the least financial opportunity to do something when something happens. You talk about cost benefit analysis, and certain communities that I see on the map um, that uh, Ms. Ms. Manley put forward. Uh, many of those communities are, are residents of public housing, uh, low-income communities that don't have the up don't have a choice to say, well, I'll just move somewhere else. There, there is no somewhere else for many of these residents. We have to make sure that we're protecting those most vulnerable. Um, and I know they want to make sure that they have a voice in what's happening in the future of their neighborhoods. So I want to make sure we, we're doing those strong outreach in those environmental justice communities as well that we can engage and we're happy to partner with you and you have my commitment that we'll do so uh, if you'll meet us halfway. <laughs> we, we're putting everything up on, on a website as the documents are developed, as information is developed and again, any, any opportunities we, we welcome to ensure that the word is getting out when those documents are uploaded, that people can go in and, and review them and, and comment on them. Okay. Carlos, do you have any more questions? So, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, we, we really need, um, I will be following up with you. Um, we d uh, most certainly need to see the 3x3x3 three by three by three real waiver granted. I'm happy to write a letter to um, to the Army in, in support of that and, and with, the, with the full voice of the City Council behind us. We want to make sure that we continue to engage with the Army Corps at, on outreach and make sure that this process takes in, I know that it can't, if you're saying it directly, it can't look by sea level rise by law, but we can bring sea level rise in as part of that conversation. We need to have that. If I might, Councilman. Sure, Bryce, absolutely. Uh, Sea level rise has been a requirement for the Corps to incorporate into our civil works projects for decades. And over the decades, we have in, uh, advanced, based on the latest sound science, the protocols by which we do that. So sea level rise absolutely has to be in all of our formulation for plants in this area. It's a mischaracterization to say that we are not. Well, I, he, he just said before, by law, you weren't able to sort of directly act on that. Maybe I'm misinterpreting. I apologize for that. To, to incorporate into our plans okay. well. the effects of sea level rise. So while some measures have to be done in tandem with that, it is also important to keep separate the risks that you have from sea level rise from those that you have from coastal storm surge. Sea level rise is a very slow process and it slowly eats away at various low-lying communities. Broad Channel, Coney Island Creek, what community is next after those, I don't know, but that's a very long-term process. Coastal storm surge kills people, causes tens of billions of dollars in damage. Sea level rise makes coastal storm surge worse mm -hmm. and will over time. We have to deal with them both, but they don't need to be dealt with necessarily as they're not the same thing. We need to be very careful about how we consider alternatives for the solution because the best alternative might be to deal with one one way, the other another way. May and that needs to be done with yeah. good coordination with other agencies sure, Paul, go ahead. and the public. Well, uh, first of all, there's been a lot of agreement today and a lot of coming together today. And I think that the process is more likely to succeed because 
of what you are all doing today. But I do want to say that that last comment by Mr. Weissmiller, I think, does not represent best practices. I think when they take into account sea level rise, they do it in terms of designing for managing storm surge. They do not co-design for storm surge and sea level rise management. And that's what this process has got to be changed to do. The waiver gets us to a time frame and a funding level that can allow us to have success. But if the only authorized goal of the study is to manage storm surge, not to manage storm surge and sea level rise, their solutions won't get funded to deal with both storm surge and sea level rise. A systems approach, as Mr. Weissmiller uh, said that we need to follow earlier in his uh, commentary, extends to this study dealing with both issues, and I would take issue with the idea that storm surge kills people and sea level rise would not kill people because if you're going to have 11 to 21 inches uh, or as much as 30 inches of sea level rise, that puts people at far greater risk of life and limb as well. So this study has got to continue to evolve. As, as, as Mr. Seabode indicated, this is the most complex project that the Army Corps has ever undertaken. It cannot be done with halfway measures or compartmentalization. <coughs> Can I just add that obviously we're also seeing that the because of sea level rise, then smaller and smaller storms become more and more dangerous and more and more deadly. So if these are not going to be addressing all, I mean, Mr. Weissmuller basically just said that one affects the other, but we're not going to address one of them in the process. I did not He's, say that. I right. said. Let, let me, let me, I mean, so just to say that to keep them separate in any part of this process is not going to give a full picture to either one of them because each of them are, di are directly affecting each other. And so we need to make sure that all of these processes are actually asking that as a formulative question and not just that it's taking it into consideration. Like there, there's very careful language that's being used here, right? You can hear that they're saying they're taking it into consideration. It has to frame the question. But it's not saying it's the actual question that they're being asked to address. Those are two different things. This is an excellent discussion, and it elucidates the cha a challenge that we mm -hmm. acknowledge we have here. We have sea level rise occurring over time. Our authority that we were given by Congress was to go and do a study to look at ways to ameliorate coastal storm risk. So. We're not doing a project review and a study to evaluate how to address sea level rise. We're, we're doing a study to evaluate how to reduce the risk of major coastal storms, and we are fully considering sea level rise and acknowledging that that's going to continue to have a impact on the size, intensity, and the reach in terms of inundation of, of these storms. So we f I fully acknowledge that sea level rise is a major component of this, but when you start to think about some of these comprehensive solutions, I'm not sure ultimately that we are going to get to a place where we can build a robust system of protections from coastal storm risk that are going to address all of the places that over time are going to see sea level rise. I think we will have places where we get the dual protections, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we heard earlier about land use modifications. We heard about money being invested by, by numerous government agencies to, to, to flood proof and, and, and buy out and do things that are going to have the longer term benefit of the day-to-day -day impact <clears throat> mitigation from sea level rise as i say it's a challenge we're 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 going to we're meeting with the river keeper in the future we're working with everyone we're looking to figure out how best to deal with this knowing this is something new and something it's a mega study for us and and we're going to have to figure it out that's the study of our lifetime right this is this is going to you know really frame how new york city and and this sort of area of the country is going to function moving forward over the next hundred years, right? So the, I appreciate the complexity of it. I just know that the more that we stay in contact with one another, the more that we, I think we need to engage with each other more, not less here. 
Um, so I, I and I think that maybe the and I know you're limited by the scope of the question that you were given to by Congress, right? So I think that uh, as we look to the future, that scope may need to have a more expansive view, but that's beyond the purview of what you currently have. But within the scope of the work that we can do, we recognize that sea level rise is playing a, a role in what's going to happen with storm surge. We have to address both. And it's something that we can accomplish, we can get done, but we need to engage with as many people as possible and, get, and make sure that we're spending dollars on the right things and come up with a plan that protects ecosystems and, and, and waterways and oxygenation, all of those things, and, and take all of these things into account and not be limited by three by three by three or, or find really any limits here because we need to look at, at, in a larger scope, right? That, that's what we all agree about. Yep. All right, so with that, I, I seeing... I, Daniel, I just I had one last yeah. point Absolutely. that I wanted to Please. add on uh, in terms of uh, a, a comment that was made about treating the uh, sea level rise and coastal flooding separately. Just to reiterate again, the points uh, that we have understood in our research is that because of sea level rise, today's 100-year flood be could become more <laughs> frequent and a 1 in 50-year flood by mid-century and a 1 in 20 or a 1 in 8-year flood by the end of the century. And to treat them separately um, would mean that you're ignoring this fact that you are, are that these storms are becoming more frequent because of sea level rise and you can ameliorate coastal flooding by addressing sea level rise so i just wanted to make that i, I that point. wholeheartedly agree with you and hear you absolutely all right so with that i'm going to let this panel uh go and appreciate all of your time and all of your efforts i know it's 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 a lot of work so thank you that was very good by the way all right so Next up, we have uh, Kevin Cabrera. Kylie O'Connor Chapman. Teresa Herrera. Perry Sheffield. Greg O'Mullen. And Catherine McKay Hughes. If you can all step forward. Thank you. So being that you're not you're not a representative of any city governmental agency or state or federal government agency, I don't have to swear you in. So I'll just, uh, we'll start here on the left and we'll work our way forward. Hi, the four of us are actually as a, as a group. Should we, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Perry Sheffield, a pediatrician, environmental health researcher, and parent. Uh, my name is Teresa Herrera, and I'm a recent graduate in public health from Mount Sinai. Uh, my name is Kevin Cabrera. I'm a medical student, fourth year at a uh, Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. And my name is Kylie O'Connor Chapman. I'm also a fourth year medical student at Mount Sinai. All right, go ahead. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to testify for the invitation. Uh, we, um, we have witnessed events like Superstorm Sandy and also the amazing New York City government uh, leading on climate change preparedness and prevention, but we can and must do more to protect all New Yorkers and especially vulnerable populations like children. Climate change research tells us that sea rise is directly linked, as we've heard today, to the worsening storm surges and more frequent flooding that our city has endured in the recent decades. And we must plan for sea rise. Otherwise, um, sandy level flooding is predicted to occur potentially as often as every five years as soon as 2030. Uh, as pediatricians, pediatricians-to-be, and public health specialists, we are especially concerned about the impact of flooding on our city's children. A flood disaster, as we saw with Superstorm Sandy, severely disrupts the basic determinants of a child's health. These include access to clean water, adequate sanitation systems, a nutritious diet, safe housing, and safe areas for learning and play. In turn, whole families' lives are disrupted as often parents cannot return to work when children's school or childcare setting is still closed. 
Children's developing bodies and brains are especially sensitive to environmental hazards and children living in poverty are the most vulnerable and most likely suffer long-term damage. So we want to share and describe a story of Jason, who's a fictionalized but realistic child who's living in a post-major storm event. He's just five years old when Sandy ravages his home in Rockaway Beach, Queens. After enduring hours of hurricane winds and rain atop a roof, awaiting rescue by boat, Jason and his family were relocated to a refugee-like tent camp where they live with suboptimal heat for weeks. Jason is often hungry and clean water is scarce. His entire family comes down with a nasty stomach virus that sweeps through the tent camp. Jason's school is also heavily damaged and he misses over a month of kindergarten. Time passes and Jason and his family are able to return home, but their home now bears the scars of water damage, such as mold, mold is rampant and roaches scurry out of faulty uh, plumbing. Jason's mother also notices changes in his behavior. He is more irritable and he now refuses to play outside or go to the beach. He also has trouble sleeping and when he does, he is awakened by frequent nightmares. Jason represents the thousands of New York children like him who have or will suffer in these ways at the next big storm. Disasters like Sandy threaten the basic health and safety of our children. Flooding acutely disrupts access to food and clean water. It also exacerbates existing food insecurity by delaying vital services like WIC and SNAP during recovery. Damage to water sanitation systems can place children whose immune systems are immature at high risk for infection and dehydration. Flooding can destroy homes, schools, and areas of play. Areas that are crucial safe havens for children become contaminated toxic zones. Structural damage increases the risk of a child's exposure to lead and asbestos. Water damage increases mold, a known trigger for asthma. Lastly, neuroscience research tells us that such trauma in early childhood, from disruption of routine like we just described, negatively impacts social and cognitive development. Trauma can also manifest as childhood depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and these disorders often persist into adulthood. We know Jason is not alone in bearing witness to and suffering the lasting effects of disaster trauma. And for Jason and the thousands of New York City children whose story he represents, sea rise is at the root of the damage uh, we describe. We strongly support the New York City City Council to pass this resolution, urging the Army Corps to consider sea rise to the full extent possible uh, to help protect the health and safety of New York's children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Uh Catherine, there you go. Do you do you need us to stay for questions, or should we step back um, to the audience? If you want to sit there, we, I'll, I'll I'll ask questions at the end. So yes. And if you're unable to stay, I completely understand. But if you'd like to stay. Um. I have two testimonies. So unfortunately, one person had to catch a plane, and he's an expert witness, and my testimony depends on his. So I will start with, um, my name is Daniel Gutman. Um, I live on the west side of Manhattan. And over the years, I've been involved with several planning and design projects on the west side waterfront, um, starting with Westway in the late 1970s, and including Riverside South in the late 1980s and 1990s and Hudson Yards more recently. I've worked with several environmental groups, including the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Environmental Defense Fund. I am currently a member of the Storm Surge Working Group. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has made several proposals in the Harbor and Tributary Study to per Protect the New York, New Jersey region from the kind of storm surge that occurred during Hurricane Sandy. The Army Corps studies currently in an early scoping and public comment phase. That's what we heard again and again today. Um, no study of environmental impacts of the core initial proposals has yet been conducted. Consequently, some whereas clauses in Resolution 509 regarding the environmental impacts um, are either premature or inaccurate. Uh, for example, the resolution states that the core should conduct a more thorough review of the environmental impacts of each alternative measure 
But then even in the absence of that thorough review, the resolution concludes that, quote, barriers are likely to restrict the migration of dot, 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 fish species important to the Hutchin uh, estuary. We simply don't know yet whether fishery impacts are likely or not. A lot depends on barrier design, which the Corps has not even begun. The resolution also concludes that the storm surge barrier would, quote, restrict natural flushing from the ocean, dot, dot, causing contamination to once again be concentrated in New York Harbor, unquote. Yet engineers studying barriers, or sea gates, for the New York City have long believed that the gates can be operated to improve flushing and water quality in New York Harbor. How and whether such a system could work would be part of the Corps' forthcoming environmental study. The resolution calls on the Corps to include consideration of sea level rise in addition to storm surge, but the Corps is already doing that by adjusting its proposals to account for future sea level. What it cannot do is sponsor a project um, whose main purpose is addressing sea level rise. That's the job of the city, which the mayor long has embraced. A 2013 report by the mayor's a special initiative for rebuilding and resiliency identified 43 miles of coastal line vulnerable to sea level rise. In its latest progress report, the administration claims to have already addressed 25 miles of coastline. If you are interested in protecting neighborhoods from sea level rise, the mayor's resiliency program might be a worthy subject for an oversight hearing. A resolution 509 refers to 60 fatalities and billions of dollars of damage due to Hurricane Sandy and acknowledges that six years after Sandy, storm surge remains a significant risk. The Army Corps study is the only effort underway with a sufficiently broad mandate to evaluate a full range of alternatives. Inclusion of regional storm surge barriers in the project scope is essential to inform decision making and an opportunity that we cannot afford to miss. Um, I will email, I'll make sure that a copy of the revised uh, proposed with some minor tweaking on your uh, resolution gets sent to you. You know I have your email. I, I know you so. do. And, 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 uh, so. I, and Mr. Gutman, I, I disagree with some of what you're saying today, but since you're not here to be cross-examined, I, I will move on to your testimony. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. I will st- Okay, I have an appendix here which might come handy. So first of all, um, I want to thank you, uh, Chair Constantinides, for speeding up the phase-out process of dirty heating oil in power plants and more recently for working on the urban green framework to reduce carbon emissions in large buildings by 20% between 2020 and 2030, which is waiting to be translated into legislation. Almost there. And I promise you I'll be back. This fall, we'll be back. Okay, and I hope other people in this room will be too. Okay, so one. Uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, need to be immediately um, wait the we need to immediately decrease greenhouse gas emissions by increasing energy efficiency and trans- transitioning rapidly to renewable fuels from carbon based. Um, we already talked about the IPPC and that but that report exposes a closing window um, that we have to choose which future we want. So that's really important. So in September 2014, New York City committed to reduce greenhouse gases 80 by 50, local law 66, with an interim target goal of 40 by 30. So we have a lot to do um, in the next 11 years to reduce it 25%. And then on top of that, we have another layer with the EPA and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration proposing to freeze the federal corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards. Um, And it would be great if you can incorporate that into your congestion pricing discussions, since we know that two thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions in the city are from buildings and roughly one third are from transportation. Um, Item two, incorporate proposed clarifications and updates by the Sorum Sturge Working Group into Resolution 509. You heard from expert witness Dan Gutman, and you'll be hearing from someone else shortly. And I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, slide 11 of their presentation, which actually addresses sea level rise. Um, It has three bullet points. Adapting to sea level rise is not optional and is a shared responsibility. This study incorporates the most recent sound science analysis of how to adopt coastal storm risk measures to increase future sea level rise in the design analysis. And it concludes that this includes assessing risk and uncertainty based in an uncertain future. So um, I also just want to make sure that you um, know about this Vox and ProPublica. They have a video. 
called about high levees and the impact that it could be for other areas that are not protected. So I want to draw you to the map on the next page to remind you where we are in the Big U. So on the Big U, we heard earlier about the ESCR, Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan, which is roughly 2.4 miles from Montgomery to 25th Street. So the city has uh, now thrown in some more money on top of the HUD for a total budget of 1.45 billion dollars to be completed by 2023. So two bridges, which is 0.82 miles south of that, between the federal funds and the city, has a total budget of 203 million. Um, we do not have a date for that. I'm representing the FIDI Neighborhood Association, which is, represents roughly 50,000 residents. Um, we, we fall under the South Street Seaport um, financial district area where the city has only allocated 100 million and an 8 million for the park for a total of 108 million. Total budget to be determined, date to start to be determined, date to be completed to be determined. Um, the Battery Park City Authority uh, plans is um, plans to issue resiliency bond to cover their 1.15 mile. Basically, the big U is far from complete, and we've had that discussion before as we approach the six year anniversary. So I just wanted uh, you to focus on that. The third item is construct a layered defense of a local seawalls and a regional New York Harbor gate system to address future storm surges. A local perimeter land-based seawalls, as proposed by the Riverkeeper, would be necessary to protect protection from rising sea levels over the decades and centuries ahead. Huge storm surges are best addressed by a layered defense system built around a regional storm surge barrier system that vastly shortens the coastline. In this situation, roughly 1,000 miles down to less than 10 miles and provides comprehensive protection against the devastation caused by occasional but massive storm surges. And um, the current study also includes uh, nature and nature-based feature examples such as tidal marsh, vegetated dune, oyster reef, and freshwater wetlands. So it's imperative to save the metropolitan region while maintaining a healthy Hudson and East River, but as you know, it's a straight. Okay. So um, just two more key facts here is the future of the National Fund Insurance Program is uncertain and is due to expire shortly next month, November 30th, 2018. We do not know if or how much the federal government will assist in rebuilding our communities after the next Superstorm Sandy. And two, Moody's, a major credit rating agency, recently added climate to credit risks and warned cities to address their climate exposure or face rating downgrades. Lower ratings would shut cities off from investments they need to adopt to climate change and to recover from future storms. So just following up, um, from my prior testimony on April 12th on page four, I wanted to ask for a status update on the Hurricane Sandy Task Force, which remember passed unanimously last year. Um, I haven't heard about the task force being formed or the one year report being created. Um, and uh, the Financial Neighborhood District Association is very concerned. Um, the second thing is also from the April 12th 2018 testimony is the mayor's management report. It has ballooned up to a 450 page document that was released last month in September from its 372 page preliminary report released last February. And there's still it fails to report on the city's targets and goals to meet its C40 commitment by 2020 and its 80 by 2050 target. Since the MMR also reflects the city's value priorities, this document needs to be updated to include indices that are annually measured and publicly shared so that the progress can be monitored and evaluated going forward. Also, Local Law 22 of 2008 requires a 30% reduction in citywide greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and requires inventory and analysis of greenhouse gas emissions no later than every September 7th and to post on the city's website a report regarding action taken. Where is that 2017 data? Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on this important topic. It's essential that the city council and the people of New York are deeply engaged in so the issues what's, of what's climate. What's your name? I'm sorry. Gregory O'Mullen. Okay, great, great, thanks. 
It's important that we're in deeply involved in the issues of climate response and protection. The issues of storm surge protection, sea level rise, and the need for broader climate change responses are real and, are, and require serious planning and action. My name is Gregory O'Mullen. I'm an environmental microbiologist specializing in water quality um, and re water resource management. I'm an associate professor at Queens College in the City University of New York. As, as I am aware, you're an alum. Um, we're proud of the work that you do. Uh, we have, I have 20 years experience as a scientist and I've studied local water quality issues for more than a decade. The scientific evidence is clear. Climate is changing. Sea level is rising. We have repeatedly seen the devastating consequences of intense storms on coastal cities, including New York. In the days following Superstorm Standy, I saw the impacts of coastal flooding firsthand um, and, the, and the interaction with environmental pollution as I was sampling water quality in the streets and basements as well as storm debris along Newtown Creek in the days following Superstorm Sandy. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports um, provide a very high degree of confidence that sea level will continue to rise and on a scale that's relevant to coastal flooding in New York City. There's a high degree of confidence that storms will intensify. The combined risk is real and it's essential to take action, but carefully considered action. The Army Corps of Engineers is proposing large-scale storm surge barriers as part of a fast-moving or initially fast-moving process with extremely limited information about the proposed alternatives at this time. The expenditures are enormous, and while that's likely appropriate, while that is appropriate given the scale, the magnitude of this issue, it also requires that the investments are well-placed. For example, it's important that storm surge barriers be carefully con uh, considered in the context of rising sea level. The environmental and infrastructure interactions of various alternatives can be far-reaching. The majority of options being considered include large um, uh, open water barriers that can limit tidal flow um, that would be closed during storm events. These are extremely, there are extremely important questions that need to be answered. How much tidal restriction? How often would they be closed? Do the requirements of a barrier for protection for, for storm surge change with sea level rise? What are the consequences for habitat, environmental health? What are the consequences for pollution in the estuary? These are just a few of the questions. Among them, we should be considering, given the expenditure, what can't we do if we do this? Can we, can we continue with the shoreline protections that are so essential in the, in the context of sea level rise if we proceed with large open water barriers? The cost-benefit analysis must include the value of our environment and the consequences for environmental pollution. These aren't simple questions, and we need to provide adequate information related to these and sufficient time to consider these interactions of um, environmental pollution and our other infrastructure projects. Based on more than a decade's experience studying water quality and sewage pollution, I've seen the influence of tidal circulation on the local water quality. New York continues uh, to deliver large quantities of untreated sewage, as well as untreated storm water, something that we're only now really starting to address, um, to our waterways. Pipes delivering pollutants, regulated and currently unregulated, are abundant along our shoreline. Areas with restricted tidal, tidal circulation tend to have poor water quality due to the local density of pollution sources. The time scale of recovery of those conditions, whether we're talking about fecal bacteria, whether we're talking about oxygen, or unregulated uh, pollutants such as pharmaceuticals, this all depends on tidal exchange. We are spending billions on sewage infrastructure and CSO long-term control plans. I've spoken to the council earlier on those issues. Even with the scale, even with the billions that are being brought to that issue, we're still not fully addressing the issue. So what's the interaction? How will altered tidal circulation influence those plans that we've previously talked about in relation to our sewage infrastructure? We need to consider that. How much worse will our, pollution, our pollutant concentrations and exposure be in the scenario where circulation is reduced? We have to consider these things and we need time to do so. We should be responding to climate change. We should be preparing for sea level rise and intensified storms. It's likely that shoreline protections are a more prudent course of action than estuary-wide barriers. We must respond to climate change and coastal flooding in a way that allows us to also address our infrastructure and environmental needs. I don't have all the answers. Respectfully, you don't have all the answers either. But I do know, it's my professional opinion, that there are important questions that we must have better answers to before we're able to proceed with selecting alternatives. It's also my professional opinion that large-scale tidal gates are problematic 
and that we should make sure that shoreline measures are prioritized in this process. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, and please give everybody my regards at Queens College. <laughs> Will do. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Goldstick. I'm a professional engineer who specializes in waterfront issues, and I'm here representing the Metropolitan New York, New Jersey Storm Surge Working Group. Uh, we're an affiliation of professionals dedicated to exploring regional approaches to reduce the risks to the whole region from flooding due to storm surges and rising sea levels. Uh, We've reviewed the resolution and agree that the limited information provided so far by the Corps isn't sufficient to allow the public to comment a number of issues. But we're troubled by a number of other premises that in, in the resolution that either aren't factual or just misleading, and I'll, I'll summarize those in a moment. Uh, but more important, if we're to accept all of the statements as correct, we can understand the logic behind the resolution. In short, the resolution states that Sandy was a devastating storm, had a devastating effect, and that some of the options the Corps is studying to reduce the risk um, of future events include storm surge barriers. And it goes on that because these storm surge barriers could have negative environmental impacts, the City Council calls upon the Corps to reconsider its proposals by including the consideration of sea level rise. That, that's, that's how it reads. I, I understand from the discussions in this room that maybe that wasn't the intent. But the Corps already intends to study environmental impacts, and the Corps already considers sea level rise when formulating proposals. So while this lack of clarity alone should probably be enough to amend the resolution, I want to address a, a few other issues and premises in there. The first is the statement that surge barriers, flood walls, and levee systems do not address sea level rise. A preliminary conclusion of a, a Hudson River Foundation study released about two weeks ago uh, by researchers at Stevens Institute of Technology and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution uh, concluded that a large storm surge barrier would probably decrease the tidal range in the Hudson River. And while that has a number of environmental implications, it also means that it reduces the high tide elevation in areas behind the barrier, which does counteract some of the impact of sea level rise. <coughs> then there are two statements that no coastal risk management project can eliminate the risk of flooding and that in-water barriers could have adverse impacts. Both statements are true, but they imply that the other risk reduction strategies being considered by the Corps have lower impacts. Because all of the options have different impacts and provide different benefits, the Corps has a rigorous process for comparing the costs, from construction costs to environmental impacts, to the benefits. And those can include that infra the infrastructure that's not damaged, the lives that aren't lost, and the costs related to business interruptions. So the Storm Surge Working Group believes that it's extremely important to ensure that accurate cost and benefit data is used for all of the options so that we can comp make comparisons among them. And the final statement uh, has to do with um, the statement in the resolution that uh, talks about restricting natural flushing, causing contamination to once again be concentrated in your harbor, one, one of your concerns. And while this is certainly a possibility, scientists have also proposed timing the opening of barriers to actually increase the flushing, which would, inc which would improve water quality. In at least two recent publications with their partners, the, the Corps with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency and the New York State DEC, the Corps has stated that the study will incorporate sea level rise in the analysis and design. And while the feasibility study does not include an evaluation of sea level rise generally on the study area, the City already conducted such an evaluation in 2013, and the City is studying designing and building flood walls and other measures to protect communities from sea level rise. The City needs to be protected from both, and we don't get to choose between them. And sea level rise exacerbates storm surge. So we believe it's appropriate for the Corps and the City to cooperate in a two-tiered approach in which the Corps focuses on measures to address storm surge while the City acts to protect neighborhoods from sea level rise. So in conclusion, there are flaws in the resolution and it's calling upon the Corps to do something it's already doing, namely incorporating, incorporating sea level rise in their analysis and design. So we would recommend the resolution be modified to call upon the Corps to provide the level of detail that an informed public requires including environmental analyses, and to call upon the city administration to prioritize shoreline projects designed to protect communities from the effects of sea level rise. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that we, there seems some disagreement on our panel here. So I, what I'll say is that I think that we want to have a detailed level of conversation. Uh, no resolution, no bill is introduced and then not amended. So I, I, I have 
not married to every word and, and period and, and semicolon in, in, in my resolution. But I am willing to recognize that there is a conversation that has to happen here and the underlying need of making sure that we're making sure, looking at the environmental impacts, looking at how to get this right is of the supreme importance here. And how we get there is, and making sure we're not limiting our options is extremely important to all of us. So I think we need to have those discussions and I think that we will continue to have those discussions as part of this legislative process on the resolution, but more importantly, as the core moves forward, we are going to looking. We're looking for a larger community engagement and a, an opportunity to think about these things in a real way prior to whittling down ideas and and, and moving forward. Great. So I appreciate all of your testimonies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have uh, Joanna Crisp, uh, Julie Welsh, uh, Rebecca Dela Cruz. And uh, Michelle uh, Lupke. Lup Lupke, sorry. My name like Constantinus, I also want to try to do my best to get it right. <laughs> you can start Hi. there on the left. Thank you. I'm Joanna Crisp. I'm here to read testimony on behalf of the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read a, a high-level summary of our ten testimony, and I'm distributing a more detailed version Great, thank for you. your review. The Municipal Arts Society of New York finds the alternatives proposed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for the New York and New Jersey Harbor Regional Storm and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study to be patently inadequate as long-term protection to coastal storm risk for a number of reasons. In general, we find the Army Corps' structural approach to storm resiliency to be self-defeating in the battle against the effects of climate change. In the event that massive in-water barriers are constructed, Tens of thousands of properties would still face risks on a daily basis due to future tidal flooding. Despite the enormous financial investment in infrastructure, the barriers would fail to protect residents and property in the long term and would have long-lasting widespread adverse ecological consequences. We also find that the alternatives, as proposed, directly contradict the recommendations in the Army Corps' own hudson Raritan Estuary Comprehensive Restoration Plan. In stark contrast to the massive structural approaches offered in the feasibility study, the restoration plan supports natural ecosystem restoration programs, increasing awareness of resiliency within coastal communities, and protecting valuable infrastructure and property against the impacts of future storms. <laughs> Furthermore, for a project of this magnitude, we find the public outreach and level of detail in the information provided by the Army Corps to be woefully insufficient. At a, minimum, we, at a minimum, we expect the Army Corps to hold additional informational meetings with affected communities before moving forward with this project. According to information provided by the Army Corps, the barrier projects would cost an estimated 10 to $36 billion to build and $100 million to $2.5 billion to maintain every year. The Army Corps has stated that maintenance and operation costs would not be covered by the federal government. Instead, these costs will fall on local municipalities. MAS finds it unacceptable to saddle local communities with the burden of astronomical infrastructure expenditures that ultimately would still leave thousands of properties and people at risk and lead to potentially harmful impacts on water quality and marine habitat. In consideration of the magnitude of the proposed structures, the astronomical costs that communities would face, and the potential ecological destruction that could occur, MAS finds that the Army Corps' community outreach efforts and information provided to be woefully inadequate. Without effective community engagement, the project will fail to respond to the needs of people most likely to be affected by the impacts of these structures, storm surge, and climate change. Therefore, we urge the Army Corps to reconsider the proposed alternatives and engagement strategy. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this vitally important proposal. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Julie Welch. I'm the program manager for <coughs> SWIM Coalition, which is Stormwater Infrastructure Matters. We are a group of 70 plus organizations who advocate for swimmable, fishable water quality in New York City through sustainable stormwater management practices in our neighborhoods. 
Our members are a diverse group of community-based, citywide, regional, and national organizations, recreational water users, scientists, architects, institutions of higher education, and businesses. Thank you very much to the Committee for Environmental Protection and to the full team who has called this hearing today. We appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony, and we thank the Army Corps for being here to hear our voices. And for this robust conversation that we are having today, it's greatly appreciated, and this is of dire concern, certainly for all of us, and we, we thank you for bringing us together so that we can work together and find the solutions that we need. I'm going to give a summary also of our testimony for the sake of time, because many people have stated the facts <laughs> that I was going to include in mine. So, um, we recognize and appreciate that the Army Corps feasibility study is intended to identify potential solutions to protect New York and New Jersey from catastrophic storm surge scenarios like those experienced with Sandy. We are very concerned about the environmental impacts of the in-water barrier alternatives in this study and what impacts they would have on our neighborhoods and on our waterways and their long-term effectiveness in the face of sea level rise. Uh, I won't quote the uh, many statistics that have already been quoted here about the sea level rise in New York City. We're all painfully aware of them and losing sleep every day about them. Um, we're very concerned about the cost, if any of these barriers are actually built, being spent and then not actually giving us the protection we need in the face of sea level rise. And so uh, we do support the call for the inclusion of worst case scenario, sea level rise, so that we can understand how these barriers are going to be impacted by it. In addition to including cost effective onshore measures, which can be built now and perhaps more readily modified as needed over time. In our recent public comment letter to the Army Corps, we, which we've attached to our testimony, we did call for a series of critical, comprehensive environmental evaluation of each and every one of these alternatives in the study so that the public can fully understand all of the ramifications, both environmental, social, and economic, of these potential barriers that should they go into the waterways, we fully understand the impacts over the long term, way out into future generations long after we're gone. We're responsible for leaving our coastlines in good order long after we depart. Uh, and with that in mind, I believe I'll just go to the closing statement rather than list all of the uh, environmental studies that we hope that you will include in yours when you get your waiver and when you move forward with your report. Uh, the public must be provided with a thorough review of social, environmental, and economic impacts of each alternative before any decisions are recommended or made. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today, and we look forward to the robust conversation ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Delacruz. I'm the Environmental Program Associate for Sina Cutson, and I wanted to thank the New York City Council for providing the opportunity to comment on Resolution 509, and we commend the New York City Council for considering this resolution um, and calling on the Army Corps to reconsider the proposals to include um, uh, storm surge as well as sea level rise considerations. Uh, Sina Cutson is a 501c3 organization based out of Poughkeepsie, New York. We own over 1,000 acres of land along the river's edge, and we have been studying the potential impacts of flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise on Hudson River waterfronts since 2006. Um, notably, Scenic Hudson's online sea level rise mapping tool uh, offers cutting edge models to project how sea level rise will affect the Hudson's tidal wetlands and shores. This tool has been used by conservation groups and local governments across the state to inform decisions that reduce risks to people, property, and nature and make Hudson River uh, shorelines more resilient for future generations. 
Our conservation science staff has worked with uh, directly with officials and citizens in several communities to convene waterfront resilient task force, notably in Kingston, Piermont, and Catskill. We've been able to accurately assess the risks, understand their options, and begin planning for safe, secure, and vibrant waterfronts in the future. Um, and finally, staff co-authored a report detailing the effects of sea level rise on the resilience and migration of tidal wetlands along the Hudson River. Uh, while we are generally supportive of the Army Corps' effort to manage the risk of coastal storm damage, we're concerned that some of the coastal storm risk management alternatives the Army Corps is considering could dramatically and permanently harm the Hudson River ecosystem while doing nothing to address the ongoing and long-term damages caused by sea level rise. It is our understanding that the CR, CSRM alternatives include, include sea level rise projections as they relate to storm risk reduction. However, the alternatives would not address sea level rise independent of severe storm events. Specifically, open barriers would do nothing to alleviate uh, daily coastal inundation and tributary flooding. In their closed state, barriers could exacerbate flooding for upstream communities when storms bring go both co uh, coastal surge and heavy rain and runoff. Water flow, including freshwater discharge and tidal regimes, will affect sediment transport, deposition, salinity, and potentially contaminant levels and dynamics. Altered sediment deposition and tidal regimes may compromise the natural ability of the Hudson River's estuary uh, tidal wetlands to adapt to sea level rise by migrating vertically or horizontally. Uh, this year, the Hudson River Foundation and the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Estuary Program uh, commissioned a preliminary evaluation of the potential physical influences that large barriers could have on the estuary. I know this report was referenced, so it is preliminary. Um, the report found that hypothetical storm surge barriers that were modeled could potentially alter the Hudson River estuary ecosystem during non-storm conditions. Modeling scenarios were conducted to evaluate potential impacts resulting from fi fixed infrastructure across the estuary ocean uh, entrance. Findings from the report indicate more restrictive barriers would lead to stronger tidal currents and mixing near barrier openings, a reduction in tidal range, currents, and mixing throughout the estuary, an increase in stratification, and greater salinity intrusion. Although findings from the support are preliminary, they provide a credible baseline for further study to evaluate the physical changes resulting from surge barriers in the Hudson River. In summary, Scenic Hudson fully supports resolution number 509 calling on the Army Corps to reconsider the proposals made in the Newark, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study <laughs> pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act to consider sea rise in addition to storm surge. Scenic Hudson also requests that the New York City Council call on the Army Corps to prioritize the study of shoreline-based measures that have the potential to help address sea level rise and exclude in-water barrier alternatives that do not offer protection from daily inundation resulting from sea level rise. In addition, given the unique hydrology and ecology of the Hudson River and that the New York, New Jersey and Har uh, Harbor and Tributary was identified as the largest and most densely populated high-risk area out of nine in the North Atlantic Comprehensive Coastal Study, Scenic Hudson urges the New York City Council to request that the Army Corps exempt the New York, New, York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study from the 3 by 3 by 3 rule. As established protocol, the district commander must submit this request and should it be endorsed to the senior leaders panel by the major, major subordinate command commander. Finally, we urge the New York City Council to call on the Army Corps to take into consideration the perspectives of the Hudson waterfront communities, a dozen of more who have expressed their concerns with in-water barriers through the adoption of resolutions. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. I've provided my contact information should you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Lupke. I'm with the Bronx River Alliance. Um, I'm also with the Swim Coalition. Um, thank you so much for holding this hearing today and for putting forth the resolution to consider um, our concerns. Um, I will also be abbreviated in my comments because you're, you've been provided with a written copy, but also it, it reiterates a lot of what my colleagues have already presented. Um, 
a little bit of information about our organization. The Bronx River Alliance serves as a coordinated voice for the river and works in harmonious partnership with more than 100 organizations and agencies to protect, restore, and improve the Bronx River as an ecological, recreational, educational, and economic resource for the communities through which the river flows. Each year through our diverse programming, we engage over 1,500 paddlers, 2,000 students and educators, and thousands of volunteers who come in contact with the river, from some for the first time. Through our ecology program, we restore habitat for local diadromous fish, including river herring and American eel, and have spent considerable time and resources on reestablishing their populations in the Bronx River. We are deeply concerned about the significant environmental impacts and other consequences that could result from the storm and surge barrier alternatives. Um, that is where I'm going to leave it on terms of that, but what I would like to say um, not necessarily from my organization, but my professional background is in fluvial geomorphology, and with all due respect, sir, water is water, even if it has salt in it or not. Um, one of the major things that I would like um, for you guys to understand, I like to use this analogy. I'm a scientist, but I'm also an educator. So when you have a hose, right, and you put your thumb over half of the hose, what happens to that water? It speeds up, right? Because by definition, discharge, which is the volume of water per unit time, the, the, um, the formula for that is cross-sectional area times velocity. So let's say in our hose example, we cut the cross-sectional area in half. By definition, we have to double the velocity. So that means that if we were to put in not only in water storm surge barriers, but also land-based storm surge barriers, what we're doing is we're basically channelizing the water. And instead of having the entire New York City to flood, we are putting it into a tube, which means it's gonna go taller, it's gonna be stronger, it's gonna undermine underneath, it's going to go over the top of and, and affect communities that would normally, normal, otherwise have considered themselves to be safe. It will also find the areas of weakness that are not protected, and it will devastate communities that otherwise were not protected. What you said earlier, um, you made the point of what happens to the areas that were affected and thus don't have these protections. This is a major concern of mine, that, that if we are to go with a hard structure solution to storm surge, that what we're going to be doing is basically making a worse problem for ourselves down the road, not only because of sea level, but also because of the barriers themselves. What I propose is looking at softening our shorelines, look at areas where we can put more rough things, so plants and wetlands at our coastal areas and, and also invest in, like the SWIM Coalition stands for, green infrastructure so that we can start soaking up some of these storm water flows in and infiltrate them back into the ground where they belong as opposed to just trying to shunt them all into our, our actual waterways because what it's going to do is just make this problem a lot worse. And so what we're recommending is, or no, what I'm recommending is that we look at more sustainable, resilient, long-term solutions to this growing water concern that will also have co-benefits and offer ecosystem services. So rain gardens that use pollinator friendly plants can also help us with our food security issues, can also help take up excess CO2 and help combat global climate change. All of these things we think need to be considered and should be considered as an alternative rather than just hardscapes that will just be changing how the water flows and not necessarily for the better. Thank you. I really want to thank you all for your testimony and I appreciate you know, the time that you spent here today. I know we're on hour three plus of our hearing, so the fact that you stayed and gave the thoughtful testimony did is much appreciated. I look forward to continuing our dialogue with one another. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, we have John Ingram from 350 NYC. Uh, Tracy Brown from Save the Sound, uh, Robert Friedman from NRDC, and Karen Immis from the Waterfront Alliance.
the last panel. We have one panel left, so after the, if you're on that last panel, if you signed in, you will be called. All right. All right, great. I guess we'll, we'll start there on the left. Karen? Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Constantinides. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. My name is Karen Imus. I'm the di uh, Senior Director of Programs at Waterfront Alliance. Uh, Waterfront Alliance, as, as some of you know, is a nonprofit civic organization and coalition of more than 1,000 community and recreational groups, educational institutions, businesses, and other stakeholders. And our mission is to inspire and enable resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. The uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report released by the UN earlier this month has only reinforced the need to prepare a region for increased flood hazards. And the accelerating pace of sea level rise increases certainty that the 100-year floodplain is not a fixed boundary. Uh, and low-lying neighborhoods with historically disenfranchised problems face higher risks of hazards during and following storms. With respect to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study, we support the intent of the resolution introduced here today. A large-scale study is needed to assess the potential solutions to adapt the New York, New Jersey Harbor and waterfront to sea level rise and an increased frequency of coastal storms. It, imp it is important that this study is consistent with that need and the New York City context. We want to underscore that there is no silver bullet to prepare for the impact of climate change on New York's waterfront, and we've heard that many times today. Decisions are being made every day by both public and private stakeholders about how our shorelines are developed, and from policy to program to build project, there are multiple solutions, the diversity of which should match the diversity of context uses and needs exhibited by New York City's waterfront. We recommend that the Army Corps of Engineers use the moderate and high scenarios in keeping with those developed by the New York Panel on Climate Change to determine the approach taken and target design level for each strategy. We face serious impacts from regular future tidal floodings as well as storms, and this consideration and the fact that strategies may be different for each must be thoroughly considered. And we submitted comment to the Army Corps with more detailed information. Um, a number of the projects being considered in the Army Corps study are long-term and costly. As you know, near-term strategies and tools are needed. The full range of these include, and these have been mentioned today, um, investments prioritizing green infrastructure, financing strategies, manage retreat, education incentives. And uh, we encourage you to look at the design standards for best practices called the Waterfront, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines developed at the Waterfront Alliance. This is a complicated multi-jurisdictional landscape. Um, that is why the Waterfront Alliance is actually convening a high-level task force over the next several months comprised of experts from various sectors to recommend climate change adaptations for our region, as well as undertake a public advocacy and educational campaign on coastal resiliency. Um, one last thing I'll say is we feel strongly that there is a need in New York City for a single manager that oversees the city's varied waterfronts. This is a dynamic uh, space requiring constant maintenance, repair, and oversight, especially with everything going on with climate change. And as some of you know, there is a bill introduced in the council which would establish an office of the waterfront that would be responsible for coordinating among the various agencies that handle matters related to waterfront use and protection, and that would harmonize the many pieces that make up its whole. Um, in conclusion, um, we look forward to working with the council and other stakeholders to ensure that New Yorkers are able to uh, uh, meet the increased threats posed by climate change, and we thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm, I'm, my name is John Ingram. I'm with uh, the Climate Activist Group 350 NYC, and I'm reading a statement by uh, Mark Laster and Dan Miner, uh, who are co-chairs of the Forest Hills Green Team, and Dan Miner is one of our members in 350. Mm -hmm. I know um, Dan. Yes, yeah, I guess you know. Um, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is considering how to protect NYC from future storm surges. They expect to winnow the list of six alternatives in their plan to two, likely to occur by the winter of 2020. The Corps' alternatives center on building in-water flood barriers to close off entrances to the New York Harbor and the event of storms. 
The Corps <coughs> estimates river barriers alternative number two could cost up to $140 billion without counting for annual maintenance or cost overruns. It would be difficult to modify the gates to cope with higher sea levels and they could have a functional lifespan of as little as 20 years. And as they will remain open most of the time, these and water barriers will not address sea level rise. In contrast, one of the alternatives would be to make our shorelines more resilient by building land-based flood walls, dunes, and levees. This approach is already being taken by New York City, is supported by environmental organizations, and would address both storm surge and sea level rise. The core estimates this alternative would cost between $2 billion to $4 billion. Shoreline measures can improve quality of life for waterfront communities, can be individually customized, can be modified or expanded over time, and will have very small maintenance costs, and will be essential for local sea level rise protection, whether offshore barriers are built or not. New Yorkers should be able to review uh, federal projects to protect our shoreline and to reject plans likely to fail uh, while wasting taxpayer money. We urge all Queens elected officials and community boards to boards to request that the Corps extend its public comment period, scheduling uh, schedule hearings in Queens, and to submit their own responses and resolutions. It's time to look more carefully at New York City's own plans for its low-lying areas. Climate changes guarantees that level, sea levels will rise and, and will the frequency and uh, strength of storms even if the details are uncertain. Besides ensuring that the Corps helps make our shorelines more resilient, we should do our part to minimize future damage by avoiding more construction and floodplains instead of encouraging it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantinides. My name is Robert Friedman. I'm a policy advocate focusing on environmental justice at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for being here. In, in, in short, we support Resolution 509. Hurricane Michael is the latest monster storm to rip into the coastal United States, one of a string of extreme weather events that have brought destruction to countless communities, from here in New York City to Puerto Rico and beyond. And as the latest IPCC report has warned, these events will continue to wreak havoc on our communities unless we change course quickly. And yet, despite the uh, scale of this crisis, the Army Corps proposed alternatives to mitigate storm surge, specifically those that include offshore barriers, missed the mark and could cause irreparable harm to the city and the surrounding region. To date, very little information has been provided about the five alternatives proposed in the Army Corps study. We don't know what type of offshore barriers could be used, the height of the uh, proposed barriers, and what types of natural features and non-structural measures will be included in each alternative. Furthermore, the Army Corps' public engagement process uh, around their proposals has been troubling, rushed, and lacking transparency. This paucity of detail related to the proposed alternatives makes it very difficult to fully evaluate them. What we do know right now is that increased storm surge is not the only impact that will result from climate change. The New York City metropolitan area can also expect to ex experience sea level rise and so-called sunny day flooding, the direct inundation of low-lying areas and the expansion of floodplains due to higher levels of precipitation. As proposed, the Army Corps' alternatives only address a limited dimension of the region's vulnerabilities. Average sea levels are three inches higher than, uh, than levels found in 1993, with no sign of plateauing. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the worst case scenario sea level rise could be as high as 9.8 feet in the northeastern United States by 2100. In comparison, the Corps' alternatives assume a worst case scenario of just under seven feet of sea level rise, below NOAA's worst case scenario by almost three feet. That doesn't even include the melting of the polar ice sheets, which is only becoming more likely. What happens, I ask, when the proposed offshore storm surge barriers overtop due to sea level rise? Offshore storm barriers are not a long-term solution to climate change. They are expensive, inflexible, harmful to the environment, and injurious to environmental justice communities and other communities located close to but outside of the barriers. Offshore storm barriers would change the natural flow of water between the Hudson and East Rivers, Long Island Sound, Jamaica Bay, and the Atlantic Ocean, and cause sewage, contamination, and other pollution to accumulate along our waterfronts. 
They would wreak havoc, havoc on communities located outside of the barriers, including New York City's numerous low-income environmental justice communities like Sunset Park, Hunts Point, East Helmhurst, and the Rockaways. It is completely insufficient to leave EJ considerations to chance. We must center those considerations and those communities. In addition, there are hundreds of languages spoken in this, in this city. All the engagement that Army Corps has engaged in thus far has been in English. That's a problem. The proposed barriers also risk uh, restricting the habitats and migratory runs of native species from the barnacle to the bottlenose dolphin to the endangered Atlantic surgeon. On top of all of this, we cannot just tr uh, treat the symptoms of climate change. We also need to treat the root problem by improving energy efficiency, transitioning to renewable energy, and ending our deadly addiction to fossil fuels. But building huge barriers to keep out the ocean only sounds appealing in its sim uh, simplicity. Unfortunately, solutions to complex problems like climate change are rarely so simple. And as the infrastructure failures in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina demonstrated, the perils of relying too heavily on a single solution can be catastrophic. In closing, we urge the committee to move forward with the proposed resolution. We thank you for your continued leadership to address the impacts of climate change and look forward to continuing to work with you as we strive for climate justice in New York City. Thank you. My name is Tracy Brown. I'm director of Save the Sound. Um, I want to thank the chairman for holding these hearings. Thank you so much. And also thank the representatives of the Corps um, for coming and for staying and listening to everybody's testimony. So thank you for your, your time and attention. Um, Save the Sound's mission is to protect and restore Long Island Sound and its environs. Um, uh, we recognize the inextricable link between our warming planet, climate change, and water quality. So Save the Sound has a climate and energy program. Um, our team uh, provides technical expertise and leadership on issues of climate and energy policy, as well as coastal resiliency. In this capacity, we've been carefully tracking this project. Um, we're very concerned, as others uh, have expressed today, about both uh, the substance of the alternatives that are proposed in the study currently and also the process, this three by three by three rule, um, just really does seem very insufficient um, to a project of this scale and we're encouraged to hear that the core um, has requested a waiver from that process and we strongly support that. Um, Save the Sound recognizes the urgent need for robust measures to protect coastal communities and critical infrastructure from strengthening storm surges and sea level rise. We support the stated purpose of the study to manage the risk of coastal storm damage in New York and New Jersey Harbor and tributaries while contributing to the resilience of communities, critical infrastructure, and the environment. Um, however, we are concerned about fast-tracking such massive projects before all the impacts intended and unintended have been thoroughly researched and assessed. Um, I've included with my written testimony um, our public comment letter to the Corps. It currently has uh, signatures from 15 entities that include um, private businesses, not-for-profits, and educational institutions, um, including groups in Queens and the Bronx, Westchester, Nassau County, at Connecticut. Um, most of the signatories on our letter and the focus of our letter are communities that are gonna find themselves just outside the barriers. Um, the impacts of the storm surges, you know, could really uh, be more detrimental than um, beneficial to those communities, and that's of great concern. Um, we do appreciate that the core has recently expanded the public outreach and will be meeting on Long Island tomorrow and did come to Westchester County, which weren't in their um, initial scope. But we also urge them to continue to reach out to those communities and, and also Connecticut as a major stakeholder. Um, on Long Island Sound, we've invested billions of dollars in the health and resiliency of that estuary. And it is really incredibly important to the whole Eastern Seaboard and the, way, the web of life. Um, the marine life, you know, estuaries are nurseries and um, 
without that nursery to allow fish to come in and reproduce, we are really putting our, our food supply at risk. So um, New York City alone recently completed an investment of nearly a billion dollars to reduce nitrogen coming into the sound from East River wastewater treatment plants. Um, that was part of a more than $2 billion invested in communities all around the Sound. And as we saw in a recent report card that Save the Sound published last month, we're actually seeing a really positive return on that investment. We had a Western Sound that was dying for low oxygen with fish um, washing up on the shorelines and massive algae blooms, a situation that we now see in the Gulf of Florida. And um, this community rallied and made a huge investment, and now we're seeing oxygen levels coming back up. We're seeing return of marine life, and it's a, it's a wonderful story. It's not only good for our local economies and communities, but it's also a model for all these other urban estuaries around the world um, that are facing the same stresses. So it's really important that um, we be mindful of those investments and that progress made and the other ways in which these estuaries that really ha are, are what makes New York City great. This is why the city is here, this confluence of estuaries um, around Manhattan Island. And um, I'm really here today to um, urge the Corps to uh, value all of the different benefits, the ecosystem benefits, the benefits to our local economies, um, of living estuaries, living water systems, as well as real estate um, and infrastructure and the other pieces that we also recognize are important. So um, we've invested a lot uh, in that living estuary. I know our colleagues have invested a lot in the Hudson and the East River is also an estuary and they're a part of what supports our life as well as our, our grid and the other um, parts of our infrastructure we're here to talk about and protect. Um, so with that, I'll just wrap up. Um, we support um, uh, the City Council Resolution uh, 905. Um, we, in our comments, support Alternative 5 uh, of the Corps' current alternatives based on the limited information we have available. That's the perimeter-only solution, which does not include the in-water barriers. Um, and we uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to submit our written testimony. Thank you. I thank you for all of your testimonies. I know it's been a long wait. I know it's been a long hearing, and I appreciate you still coming out with thoughtful testimony and uh, contributing to this conversation. And I think that we all agree that we want to make sure that as we move forward, that there are any unintended consequences, that the solution is puts us in a place that's worse than we were before. So I think we share that goal. I think we will all work together to get there. So thank you for your time and efforts. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, last... Uh, panel, Andrew, uh, Andrew Joel, uh, Rob Schneck, Jay Lair, and Richard Reese, Rice? Reese, okay, great. Okay, yep, I'll give, uh, here you go. I'll take mine and we go from there. Thanks. All right. All right, so I've got four cords and four people, so we're in good shape. All right. I can start there on the left and. My name is Chairman. My name is Jay Lair. I'm a uh, science director of the Heart Institute. I flew in from Columbus, Ohio today. Our home office. Nope, sorry. Wait, wait, make, sure sorry. You, make sure your thing's on. There you go. Uh, okay, our home office is in uh, Arlington Heights, uh, Illinois. We're a free market uh, think tank, and I've been science director there for 25 years, but I grew up on the streets of New York, uh, attended Princeton University, moved west, uh, got my PhD in water resources and environmental science from the University of Arizona. Uh, I have been studying uh, climate change since the mid-70s, uh, when uh, global cooling was the uh, concern, pretty much every major news magazine had pictures of the forthcoming glacier. We switched to uh, uh, global warming uh, about uh, 15 years uh, later when Al Gore uh, came along. But I've been studying sea level for uh, really since the mid-70s uh, and 
uh, am considered uh, expert in that uh, area. And I want to tell you that uh, during the Obama administration, Mr. Obama asked the uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Agency to uh, really double their efforts in uh, studying sea level uh, as a result of the concern uh, that climate change would have an effect on it. And uh, they uh, instituted an update on uh, 200 uh, sea level uh, tidal gauges around the United States uh, on the East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, six island uh, sets out in the Atlantic, seven in the Pacific. And uh, then they did a 10 study, 10 city study on the most stable land masses in the, in the world. Uh, and those included uh, Denmark and Spain, uh, Australia, and uh, also looking at Honolulu. And uh, they look very stable records in uh, uh, Alaska along the uh, California coast, the Atlantic coast. But the poster child for uh, sea level understanding is the battery right here in New York. We have a 160 uh, year record there, and it has been rising steadily at 11 inches per century. And the projection of all of those records taken monthly for 160 years is that the sea level will continue to rise at 11 inches per century for the next century. Kings Point has about almost a 100-year record, and it's the same rate of, uh, of rise. Uh, as you look around the world in uh, Australia, uh, sea level is a very local measurement. Uh, and, and while maybe we're a few inches higher per century here in the uh, metropolitan area, uh, elsewhere in the world it's con considerably lower. Uh, Honolulu is about six inches a century. Uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Spain, and Bombay, India are under four inches uh, a century. Uh, the highest uh, sea level rise rates uh, happen to be in Atlantic City and the Gulf Coast, which are uh, around 15 inches per century. But the numbers, and, and I want to applaud the, the council and everything they're doing uh, to increase the resiliency against the next superstorm, uh, Sandy. In fact, pretty much everything I've heard here about things that are being done uh, to protect the citizens and the environment uh, uh, are, are really splendid. The one thing that's wrong is to take, <clears throat> excuse me, to take into account the idea that sea level may rise here, <clears throat> excuse me, a few feet, uh, uh, three feet or seven feet. These numbers simply uh, are unsupportable uh, scientifically. So I, I think that basically you're on track to do all the right things considering you don't want to have the destruction of another uh, Superstorm Sandy, but I think you shouldn't be uh, considering the catastrophic projections of sea level rise. They're not there. You can't support them. They're not going to happen. But by and large, uh, what the Corps is doing, I think, is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, we'll come back. <laughs> we'll come back. Okay. I just, <coughs> I just wanted to. Uh, my name is Bob Schneck. I'm a uh, downtown resident for 30 years, and I've been through a lot uh, as part of the community. And I, after, uh, after Sandy, I think uh, I have been concerned, just an intense just because of the threat that we continually uh, face downtown and in New York, and that this is really, uh, this is really something that um, takes really long-term solutions. So I had an experience that I want to share that was really profound for me, which is I happened to be on the first Cathay Pacific flight landing uh, after Typhoon Makut in uh, Hong Kong, <coughs> and I was right there after I, I experienced what happened to New York after Sandy, the fact that we're still kind of repairing, we'll be repairing uh, subways for years. But in Hong Kong, they had the whole thing in order over the, the entire experience. So for example, they had a thing called a red alert, which they had never used before. Um, the, Everyone apparently responded correctly to that. And so all the subways and buses were up within 24 hours. The schools were back in place uh, by uh, 48 hours. The major thing that happened was that the, 
this particular storm had never, Hong Kong, for all of its experience with storms, had never experienced anything of this intensity before. So the lesson, so they are, are taking this to the next level, which is maybe they have to build levels above levels because, uh, because it can be that the intensities of these storms uh, and the measures we have, things like 100-year, measures like 100-year uh, frequencies, they um, probably aren't right. Probably there are new levels of forces involved with this, although I'm, God knows I'm not a scientist that way, but it feels like we not only have to account for more storms, but also more powerful ones. And it's the power <coughs> that was the big difference in the Hong Kong storm, and that is that probably one out of every 10 trees that Hong Kong's built on uh, on a very uh, steep terrain, so it has huge um, forests in the middle of it, amazingly. And in those forests, one out of every ten trees were ripped out. It was the amount of the amount of damage that they sustained was incredible. However, the city went on, didn't miss a beat. And I think that uh, that is a that's a standard I'd like to see us work toward here. I think that there's, in studying resiliency, he had a number of, you kind of look globally, and we've kind of looked to Europe for solutions, but by God, they, somehow or another, Hong Kong got that right. And we should really learn from them. I have no idea what they have done in terms of storm surge, but in terms of organizing their city, in terms of having systems for looking after people, in terms of having, they have amazing tall buildings all over the place, and they held just fine. So they have to have building codes and resiliency codes uh, that actually they thought through years ago so that all of the standing structures are in place. So I just wanted to note that it might be of some use to understand um, the, the resiliency practices of a place uh, like Hong Kong. One thing I did when I returned is I went to the uh, Manhattan Community Board three coastal resiliency meeting because I'm I'm curious about resiliency and I, I think it's important for every citizen to care about these things. <coughs> and I was shocked that the community, community board three had been involved for four years working with the government to come to an understanding of what they were going to do. So the person who had been in charge of that process, who had the job, got promoted and someone else got promoted. So this other person came into place and he decided on his own that that wasn't the best plan and he overthrew the whole thing, came in with a completely different plan that no one had ever seen before and claimed that he had, um, that he had used community input because what he was going to use is what the community said about programming. Everything they said about their parks, what they thought about the, the trees that they had, all of the agreements they had about timing, all of those things went away and the price of the project doubled, which uh, I think is a horrifying fact that the gover that, that a governing agency should take the, take, uh, the costs of things so lightly. So I, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm very concerned as a, as a downtown resident, I'm concerned that when, as the big U comes into our space, we should demand better process and consideration in how the, these plans move forward because they are major um, matters for the public and major matters of protection and concern for the people that actually live under them. I wanted to say that I really think that the Army Corps of Engineers is, is really stepping back and thinking about the process and just intrinsically engineering, <laughs> to be an engineer is to solve problems. And I think, that the, I think that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing a fairly exceptional job of backing off of this and kind of doing something that's a little bit strange to them, which is, addressing community concerns on a large scale that they really haven't been called upon to do before. So uh, that, uh, I, I hope this is helpful and that there could be some useful follow-up on any of this. So, 
and thank you for your patience in, in, in doing this. <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Mm -hmm. um, made sense. Uh, my name is Andrew Jewell. Uh, I'm a resident of Nyack, New York, where I have a view of the Hudson River from my home. Um, and I appear here today as a, simply as a concerned citizen of the Hudson, Hudson Valley. But I should also point out that I'm a, a research professor at Columbia University. And I've been studying water quality in the Hudson River for uh, the last 12 years. Um, and in that capacity, I've co-authored a, a number of scientific publications related to many different aspects of Hudson River water quality. And I was also uh, recently the lead author of the Waste and Stormwater Target Ecosystem Characteristics Report that was part of the Hudson River Comprehensive Restoration Plan, uh, which was commissioned by Partners Restoring the Hudson. And in my written testimony, I have some links to uh, those reports. Um, I also want to point out that I was a resident of uh, Piermont, New York during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and uh, while my own home was not damaged by the storm, many of my neighbors were not so lucky. And so um, uh, many parts of Piermont sustained extensive flooding. And so I have a personal appreciation of the goal that the, that the Corps is trying to address in their proposals. And I'm actually very encouraged by many of the things that happened in this meeting. So thank you very much for um, taking the time to do this. Uh, so with regard to um, many aspects of water quality, the good news, which I think probably act doesn't get said often enough is that the situation in the Hudson and New York Harbor uh, is greatly improved compared to 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and there are many examples of this. Most of my work relates to fecal indicator bacteria and counts of fecal indicator bacteria around New York City are, are generally much, much lower now than they were in the past. Um, hand in hand with those improvements in water quality, which can be measured in many different ways, uh, has come a rediscovery of the Hudson River as a recreational and aesthetic resource. And you see this up and down the Hudson River Valley. Uh, in my work, we travel uh, the entire distance of the Hudson once a month for sampling purposes. And as we go along, we see cities and towns from New York to Albany uh, recognizing the newly improved value of their waterfront property. Uh, and that comes in the form of uh, new parks, access points, marinas, waterfront restaurants and cafes. Mm -hmm. Uh, residential developments of all kinds. And this is one of the ways uh, these types of public and, and, and private investment in waterfront lands are one of the ways that we can see that the citizens of the, of the Hudson River Valley, which includes the citizens of the city, um, have uh, changed their relationship with the Hudson River. And uh, they now value being close to the waterfront, uh, which was not always the case. And uh, that change, in my opinion, is directly connected to the decades-long improvement in water quality that we've experienced. Of course, the more that that waterfront is valued, the, m the greater the incentive to protect that land from flooding and storm damage. And obviously, that's why the Corps is taking this feasibility study, undertaking this feasibility study. However, given that there is a connection between water quality and the value of uh, waterfront lands, it's, it is imperative that any mechanism to protect such lands and property does not damage water quality. Uh, if a flood protection mechanism was put in place that caused water quality to decline, that protective mechanism would degrade the value of waterfront land and property just as effectively as flooding would. It would happen in a different way. It would probably happen at a very different time scale, but it would happen nevertheless. And it's currently impossible to predict with any confidence the degree to which water quality would be impacted by any of the proposals that have been described there. Um, intentionally, uh, this is a very early stage of the process, obviously, and so they are intentionally vague. Uh, so we lack any kind of sufficient detail, but we can anticipate uh, that any alternative that's based on barriers is going to negatively impact water quality within the Hudson and New York Harbor, even when the barriers are open, and of course much more dramatically when the barriers are closed. Um, that is an inevitable consequence of uh, flushing through the system. One of the things that really surprises people when I talk to them about the data that we've collected uh, about microbial water quality in the sampling uh, in the Hudson is that um, the waters around New York City uh, generally share um, similar water quality as locations that are much further north, locations that have much lower populations. And to some extent, that is the result of public investment uh, in infrastructure related to sewage and stormwater handling. Uh, but it is also very largely uh, because the system is extremely well uh, flushed. The residence time is quite short. Um, and. Um, when we do see spikes in poor microbial water quality around New York City, they're typically triggered by rainfall, which leads to sewer overflows, as has been mentioned. But those are quite short-lived. And again, the reason for that is because you have this short residence time, because there's a tremendous amount of input of clear, cleaner water um, that flushes out the system. And 
it is inevitable that building any kind of barrier is going to that requ will require some in water structures that will impede the flow in and out of the system to some degree. We don't know what degree that will be because we don't know exactly what kind of barriers will be built, but they will certainly impede flow. And that is true whether the barriers are open or closed. Uh, they have to have some obstruction to the flow in order to put something there. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, obviously, uh, when you close the barriers, you get a much bigger impact. Initially, of course, the barriers are going to be designed to be closed only infrequently, but as sea level continues to rise, uh, the frequency and perhaps as storms become more uh, intense, the frequency of closures is going to similarly increase. And so you're going to have resultant impacts on water quality increasing through time. Um, so the idea that you would have a, a buildup of contaminants is one potential issue. The other potential type of water quality problem uh, that could be exacerbated by impeded flushing and increased residence time is algal blooms. Um, under current conditions, algal blooms in the main channel of the Hudson and the waterways around Manhattan are largely inhibited because of high turbidity and vertical mixing. But uh, if you impede the flow, you will uh, decrease mixing, you will increase stratification, um, and allow turbidity to set out, settle out, which will all improve conditions from the perspective of algal growth. Uh, and given the high levels of nutrients that are available for algal growth in Hudson, there's a lot of potentially negative impacts. Um, uh, simple things like being unsightly or smelling bad, but also the possibility of transmission of toxins to wildlife um, and hypoxia. So I want to emphasize that uh, my statements about potential water quality impacts of impeded flow are, are not idle speculation. We see um, these types of changes uh, all over the place currently, uh, but only in very limited areas. And we sample a lot of uh, embayments around New York City and along the East River. Um, and it, almost in every single one of these embayments, as we go into them, um, the, the embayment represents a, a gradient of flushing by cleaner water. And so. Um, as you go deeper into any particular embayment, you see decreased flushing, you see greater contaminant concentration, you see higher levels of stratification typically, turbidity often declines, you get algal blooms, those are accompanied by um, localized or temporary hypoxia. So, you know, that highlights the importance of flushing or the restriction of flushing, I guess, to um, water quality in our local waters. So it is actually pretty easy to... Uh, to predict the general consequences of, um, of impeded flushing to, to water quality, although we don't know to what extent um, we're going to have impedance of the flow. Obviously, that depends on the details of the plan. But even if the initial impacts on flow and water quality are predicted to be minimal, as sea level rises, the impacts are going to increase. Uh, and that is going to effectively drive us further along that gradient towards the problems that we now see in more restricted waterways. Um, and then finally, uh, just a personal note, as sea level rises at some point, uh, any in-water barrier system is going to be overtopped, as people have mentioned earlier today. And so at that stage, we're going to have to resort to some other mechanism for protecting shorelines. And so it might be uh, prudent to think about what those solutions are going to be eventually. And uh, perhaps if we incorporate those into our planning now, um, we may come up with solutions that are more resilient, less expensive, and do not negatively impact the water quality that's essential. Uh, to the value of our waterfront lands. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, my name is Richard Reese. I run a project based at Hunter College called City Atlas, which is about the future of New York City. Our advisor is Bill Selecki, who is the co-chair of the city's climate panel. Um, but I, I'm speaking here. Uh, on my own behalf, um, we launched in 2011 s with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, the goal was to provide a sort of front end for the city's climate information. And I'd say if everybody could have spent the last seven years doing what I've been doing, this would be a different meeting. <laughs> um, I, I actually think uh, the Army Corps making a sincere effort at trying to do something that's really hard. I'm also new to this process, by the way, so I checked the wrong box on my, my note for the resolution. I'm actually uh, skeptical of the harbor barrier for reasons that have to do both with the ecological reasons and because sea level will overtop it. 
So I, I'm just going to make a brief comment on sea level. Um, and I, we have a Twitter feed, uh, City Atlas, and I will share this stuff on Twitter this afternoon. Uh, Richard Alley, who is probably the top glacier expert, sea level expert in the US, um, in September, he did an online seminar and mentioned that 10 foot or above before 2100 is a, uh, a real possibility. Um, and the reason things are going in that direction is because ice cliffs in Antarctica are unstable and they seem to have a maximum height that they can reach before they collapse, before they tumble. And uh, the mechanisms behind that are, they don't have a defined timeline. So up until 10 years ago, they felt that this was a decades and centuries, centuries process, but they, they don't necessarily feel that. So the, obviously that makes a big difference because if in two years or five years, there's a paper showing this timeline moving forward, then the commitment to a harbor barrier would, would change. Um, and I think that goes to the whole question of what we're doing because a, a commitment of $20 billion for coastal defense uh, maybe the point is how do we commit to the mitigation goal that the IPCC report uh, frames. And, and uh, that's where I would, that's basically the, to sum my observations up is that the message of the IPCC report is about the target, the mitigation target, which is extremely ambitious. Um, so I think that's, that's really where we should shift the focus and the city could help do that. And that doesn't necessarily mean a harbor barrier is ruled out. It just means that the public dialogue is informed on it. So people will understand if we can, if we can make the two degree target, I think the 1.5 also being honest right now, I think 1.5 might be a little bit in the rear view mirror, but if we aim for two, that will at least hopefully help give us better odds on issues like abrupt sea level rise. That means a lot for New York because New York is not mitigating on an, you know, the, the culture hasn't absorbed this uh, at, at the depth necessary. Um, and what I'll share on, on Twitter is Paris has a plan that is directed to the public. And I think that's the next step for New York is really to make an open plan to talk about talk about it to everybody in the city and particularly I think it, at the highly educated and high income level, part of the city has to start to reframe to take this into, to absorb this, uh, internalize it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And, and, and so, Mr. Lara, I, I want to kind of come back to you, my friend. All right. So, um, come a long way from New York City. Uh, yes, I flew in this morning and hope to be back this evening. Ah, I'm, I'm glad. I, I grew so up. What, right what here. inspired I, this trip? I love you uh, coming here to uh, make a statement because uh, it's interesting that everybody here is so worried uh, about increasing sea level rise when the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric uh, Agency has the best record on the planet right here at Battery Park, 160 years, which shows no increase in the rate of sea level rise while the increase in carbon dioxide has been uh, 30 percent over the last 40 years, uh, the rate of sea level rise in the metropolitan area has not changed at all, and they are predicting it will not change. It's been about 11 inches a century uh, at the Battery, 11 inches a century at Kings Point, and NOAA predicts the same thing. And the gentleman who just mentioned uh, the ice coming off uh, NOAA has records at Sitka, Alaska of uh, sea level change, and there where supposedly glaciers are melting and icebergs are melting, the prediction at Sitka, Alaska is a decline in sea level rise of nine inches over the next century. So there is this catastrophic fear 
that so, is, so, you're, so you're telling me that the New York City panel on climate change has completely got this wrong, that everyone in this room uh, has somehow gotten this wrong today? That I am the, definitely... Mid, let, me, let me finish. Okay. My turn to talk. <laughs> um, so the middle range that they show, um, or about the low range estimate is 15 inches. The high estimate is 75 inches. So you're telling us we're nowhere near any of that. We're uh, all here I am, today talking at ourselves I am, for no reason. Costa, I am saying exactly that. You are no longer, you're nowhere near that, and you're ignoring our own government agency. No is an outstanding agency. You're, you're ignoring uh, a, a very liberal president that thought climate change was a problem who directed NOAA to really double their efforts in collecting data, and the data they collected does not at all support your uh, view of climate change. But we're not talking about My carbon view dioxide. Of climate change. So let's talk about that. So I okay. see that you have put up publications recently why the UN Climate Report cannot be trusted. Absolutely. How Al Gore built the global warming fraud. That's correct. So I am the I author thought, of those documents. You are the author of those I documents. Am. So you do not believe that climate change is man-made, and you do not believe we're contributing at I, all. Absolutely not. Okay, that's, uh, it's, uh, good. And, and, it's good. And I flew all and, and, the way and here. And we're all somehow wrong, and somehow you're the one well, who got it right. I, I, you're <laughs> wrong only because you're not looking at real science. And I flew here just to be one voice of of scientific reason rather than emotion. Okay, so I'm, 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 uh, no, no, from the crowd, please. You know, we got We want to keep some <laughs> level of decorum. Um, so, uh, where does the Heartland Institute get its funding from? Uh, individuals. We are a very small organization. We get no money from oil companies or no large money from Exxon Mobil at all. Not in the last fifty. I've been there twenty five years. I would and say nothing, not in the last. So 20. the Guardian article that exposed Exxon Mobil as a big funder and the Mercer family uh, uh, was all, completely wrong. Uh, the nothing from Exxon Mobil for sure. I don't know anything about funding from the Mercer family, and nothing I don't think the they're in the oil business. Although well, no, they're not in the oil business, but they are a large climate denier. We we have a budget of six and a half million dollars a year. The, about eighty percent of it comes from individual small donations. Individual small donations. Individual uh, small. We are not a I, mouthpiece I, for any corporation. Really? What's yeah? Really? Can we you turned say that down with a straight face. We turned oh, easily. We turned down money from the Coke. Uh, foundation because they wanted to run our organization. We don't do that. But Basically, we are a free market organization that wants to see uh, to keep government out of our pocketbooks and look at things objectively rather than emotionally. Keep government out of your pocketbooks how? Uh, individual freedom. Individual freedom. Individual freedom. Yes, I think. But yeah. wouldn't it, we're it, a libertarian organization? Ah, okay. So, so if 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 things do, if somehow our view is right and your view is wrong, and, and so, but then there isn't an economy, but you're okay with that. No, I'm not okay with that. There's no chance of you being right and me being wrong. Really? Really. Not on climate change. No chance at all. And I hope we all live long enough to see it. In fact, I, I, in, As do I. I, I okay. I'm, I've got a nine-year-old son who's, in 20 who's, who's years, very impacted. In 20 years, New York City will be making some uh, resilient adjustments to the fact that probably we'll be entering a period of global cooling as a result of the fact that the the sunspots are at a, at a very low point and we could probably look forward in 20 years to uh, maybe a degree and a half Fahrenheit cooler and we'll manage we're, we're resilient you've proved your resilience in this room I'm I'm absolutely astounded at all the terrific things you're doing for the citizens of New York with regard to protecting against storm surges and the like it just isn't about so all these, sea level all these hundred year storms that keep blowing through and different parts of the world are, are of no consequence they're just they're not man-made that's for they're sure. not man-made no nothing no it's arrogant to think they are man-made because nature is so overwhelming compared to what the impact that we have you can change a microclimate in phoenix arizona people used to go there uh when they had breathing uh problems before they built 125 golf courses and irrigated them phoenix arizona is no longer so dry you you impact small areas but you can't impact the planet at all and the other 99% of the scientists who believe that your, our view that is right? That isn't true at all. That 99%, 97%, that's ridiculous. 97% of nobody agrees with everything. We, have, uh, we sent out a, a statement to 33,000 scientists that all said, uh, you know, man-caused global warming is ridiculous. And it is ridiculous. 
I, I am astounded, um, but I, I appreciate your time and being here, and I appreciate you taking my abuse in, in the way that you have. And I, I don't I, mind it at all. I think you're I, amazing. You've been sitting there for four hours. Your patience and, and paying attention, you are amazing. My, my hat's off to you. But, but I, I think we will strongly agree to disagree on this one. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I, I think that, uh, I, yeah, we're, we're just going to agree to disagree, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a measure of the quorum here. No problem. And I appreciate being invited to come and speak. I always appreciate everyone who... And, has I, and I was invited by the council. I, I always appreciate the opportunity for everyone to come here and have a, a spirited debate. I definitely appreciate the Army... I, I mean, I've dismissed this panel, so thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank the Army Corps of Engineers. I, I appreciate the end of this hearing uh, livening up, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> But I appreciate the Army Corps of Engineers. I look forward to your partnership and all of the mayor's office and everyone who took the time to testify today. Thank you to our attorneys, Samara Swanston, Nadia Johnson, uh, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, my legal counsel, Nick Wazowski, and, and all of you. And I look forward, to, really, to the Army Corps of Engineers to getting this right. So let's have a long and, and fruitful discussion. With that, uh, this hearing is now gaveled closed. <laughs> Well, thank and you. it's okay that we just... Uh, uh, you know, that's what America's